It's time for Mac Break Weekly. Everybody's in the house. Jason Snell's back from his visit to Cupertino. Andy Anatko's here. Um, uh, Alex Lindsay as well. And of course, we're going to be talking about the new iPhone, the new Apple Watch. But there's also iOS 17, iPad OS 17, and the new Watch OS. There's lots ahead. Mac Break Weekly is next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Mac Break Weekly, episode 887, recorded Tuesday, September 19th, 2023. Focay. This episode of Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by Discourse, the online home for your community and ours. Discourse makes it easy to have meaningful conversations and collaborate anytime, anywhere. Visit discourse.org slash twit to get one month free on all self-serve plans. And by Fast Mail. Reclaim your privacy, boost productivity, and make email yours with FastMail. Try it now free for 30 days at fastmail.com slash twit. And by Delete Me. Reclaim your privacy by removing personal data from online sources. Protect yourself and reduce the risk of fraud, spam, cybersecurity threats, and more by going to joindeleteme.com slash twit and using the code twit for 20% off. It's time for Mac Break Weekly, the show we cover the latest Apple news. This is the uh, the week where we take a breath after the excitement of last week and assess. Now, here's some good news. We've got Jason Snell back. He was in the house yeah, last week and will give us his thoughts from SixColors.com and Macworld. Thank Great you be for back. being here. Yes, we missed you. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, Andy Anako, WGBH, Ballstone. Hello, Andy. I apologize. I was literally miles from you, enjoying the muggy, muggy humidity of, of beautiful <laughs> Rhode Island and of the Narragansett Bay. But uh, I, I we were kind of busy. I couldn't. No, no worries. As as I like to say, it's, there's a, it's not a social obligation. It's a social opportunity. I would love and to have seen you. Doesn't say. <laughs> you know, we have a lot. Patrick Delahanty's nearby. He's in Milford. Milford. Uh, uh, Lou Maresca is in uh, the area. He says, I'm minutes away if you need a hand. Andy, uh, it turns out there's something about that area. It's just Paul Therott used to live near nearby. <laughs> it's far, yeah. There's it, 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 something about like people who need to be near Boston but can't. They can't even closely afford to live actually That's in right. Boston. That's, That's exactly that causes right. these clusters of independent <laughs> uh, creative That's types. Exactly right. We were in. Uh, we went to a great restaurant in Warren, Rhode Island. Uh, and I'm thinking I'm really close to Andy now. And uh, <laughs> it was good. The Bywater, great uh, fish place. Really, really enjoyed it. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. That was my thank you to my sister and my uh, my nephew for helping out with all the hard work. And uh, all the way from OfficeHours.Global, which is almost as near as Andy is to my mom, uh, Mr. Alex Lindsay. Hello, Alex. Hello, hello. You're in our neck of the woods, and I still haven't seen you in ages. <laughs> and so you know it's comfortable it, it is I, why go out the drive why the, leave the drive is really uh pretty comfortable here i yeah. I, I walk uh barefoot from the kitchen to the <laughs> to the office and why change leave? Shirts like like mr rogers and and off we go so we have a new iphone um the iPhone. We don't have it yet. Well, well maybe we get it on Friday. Some people do. <laughs> I need it. Uh, there we go. There there's we go. always dropped. So there, some people do. There's always yeah, somebody yeah. who gets I it don't. by accident early, and then there's the reviewers. And I'm just going to say, Jason, that the review embargo usually is the Wednesday before the phone ships. So I am not going. No, it, it dropped this morning. Oh, so you can talk. I I don't have one, so oh. I could talk. I can always talk. <laughs> I'm free to talk. But the reviews are starting to come have, in, But huh? the embargo reviews uh, dropped for phone and not watch, so I guess they're going to roll the thunder. But uh, for the phone today, so like okay. the Verge, the watch. The there's the probably not a whole lot to say. I asked uh, Michael, our 20 year old, who's been waiting to get a new iPhone, uh, and I said, "You're going to get a new watch of that?" He said, "Because he has an Apple Watch." Uh, he said, "What's the difference?" I said, "This you summon this." <laughs> he said, "No, <laughs> I don't need. I don't yeah. need." 
And, this. and I think even and even that's not new. Like, <laughs> yeah, you can get an accessibility. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm trying. I'm trying to wrap my. I've, I can't find a technical answer to the question of why are they announcing this as a new feature when it is something that's been in accessibility for quite a while. Like, are they are they have they just simply promoted it from okay, you are no longer accessibility, you are now a mainstream feature, or are they have they basically added enough AI elfin magic to the feature to make it more reliable and more. Uh, the, the difference between someone who uses an accessibility feature because that's what's required to uh, to use that device and the difference of, of, of the difference between someone who's using it because, hey, I expect this as just a regular part of the portfolio of features. Maybe it has to work a lot better and a lot tighter. The uh, the people that uh, Apple cares about these days have have weighed in of course even though <laughs> you know uh i justine says it's not a phone anymore uh it's a, i think she i imagine I, she's gonna say it's a camera right i have to admit that I, I i've been thinking about that a lot because i i'd say i ordered it and i looked at the feature set you know a lot of the um the bits and pieces of it i'm not sure like aces support and so on for for the captures you know log aces and having the black magic you know camera and all these other things i was like i don't know if i'm going to give up my 14 because i may still use my 14 as a phone and just use the 15 for a while as a camera you know and, and not really you know like not think about it because it's very multi when you think about it as a camera you think about it as a multi-purpose camera with you know i can do 3d i can do other things and i may want to use it or even put it into rigs that other people are using and then it's no fun to have it be a phone but the problem with the phone is all the interruptions and all the other things yeah. that may happen in that area and so um so i'm i'm still i even though i asked for the box to send my my 14 back i'm now on the fence. This is why they don't give you money ahead of time. Gave my, <laughs> I gave my sister my iPhone 14, so I am iPhoneless for the first time ever this week, and that means my watch doesn't work either. Uh, I'm, I'm all Android, Andy. I'm like you today. I'm, a, I'm an Android man, uh, but I'm surviving. It's not the end of the world, you know. I'm using Android Auto instead of CarPlay. Justine, uh, of course, this is part of being in the in crowd. Has of course a video of her. And Tim Cook hugging, uh, as does Marquez Brownlee. I guess that's part of the deal. If you go to the event, did you get a picture with Tim Cook? Did he? I, I, I the line was too long. Is what I want to say. <laughs> I know I didn't. I didn't. I didn't see him there. I happened to get. I, I got through it. It was weird because the iPhone event is very strange because it's the the media composition is completely different. A lot of international media, um, but. I was able to get into the hands-on area and like do all the stuff surprisingly fast. Usually you get stuck behind a YouTuber from a <laughs> unknown country that's speaking a language you don't understand and they're doing their entire stand-up and their entire demo and you lose the will to live. And I, <laughs> and I was able to pop yep. in, in there real fast and like I was over at the Apple Watch and they're like, oh, put on the watch. Let's do the new thing with the gesture. And I went over to the phones and they're like, oh, here it is and you can pick it up. And like I... I, I was surprised. I w after about half an hour, I was like, I think I've literally touched all the stuff and gotten all the demos. And and I don't think Tim was even there yet because he sort of, you wait to make an appearance yeah, and yeah. the mob comes and everybody takes their pictures of, of Tim and they get their hugs, apparently. I missed the sign for the free Tim Cook hugs. Free hugs. <laughs> I mean, I'm a little sorry, Tim, because I, you know, I invited him to the Cal Auburn game the, the, that weekend, and he never got back to me. Oh Ghosted man, me. I had an empty seat next to me. Aww. So come on, Tim. <laughs> He's probably there, right? Like, but in the fancy part. Here's not, Jason's you know, with uh, us, article: so. My Easter basket of reactions to Apple's phone event. You, sure. that, so you guys weren't sitting out in the uh, rainbow. Uh, stage, you were inside. Oh, no, in no, we theater. were in the Steve Jobs Theater. Nice, because that's where the demo area is. Is is you 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 go back out of the theater to the back and exit, and there's a a huge area. This is all purpose built to do this. Purpose built that when you emerge from the theater, which used to have live presentations, but now just plays the video. Uh, Tim did come out on stage and welcome all of us, and then he went away and played the video. But you emerge from the back of it, and they've got this uh, giant setup with all of the products on long, super long tables. It's kind of like a weird alternate universe Apple store kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then the, and every, at you know, and they were, they did, a, there were a lot of people there um, demoing the product, which is probably why I got through it so fast, is that they really made an effort to have huge amounts of product with huge amounts of demo stations. And that's the that's the real value in going, is that last Tuesday, I got to hold right. an iPhone 15 and a 15 Pro, and you got uh, a lot kind of, of funny. You got a lot of press because uh, you said how light it felt. 
Exactly. Well, that, I was going to say, it's kind of funny because, you know, that, I think that pickup test is actually one of the most important things and it's experiential. So at that moment where I've been carrying around an iPhone 14 Pro for the last year and I picked up the 15 for the first time and I really want to remember what my reaction is because I'm never going to get an initial reaction again. And my reaction was, wait a second, like it felt so much lighter. I, I really believed that it was going to be, you know, measured in grams and technically it's lighter but the act the act of picking it up and holding it you know holding it up in my hand uh i could absolutely tell that it was lighter presumably because of the titanium which led to my friend the dr, dr. Drang, Drang. I mean, I was writing an dr. entire Drang. thing with math <laughs> about how if you change the weight around the edges yeah. you will get he says it's probably also that it is 10 percent lighter but the, it might be heightened by the fact that the edges aren't as heavy as they used to it's be it's the rotational inertia and he oh by the God. way he shows the math he, oh yeah! I, I don't even know how to generate those math equations in HTML. <laughs> no, I'm very impressed. If, <laughs> if you read Dr. Drang's blog, you'll find that he's been experimenting with different techniques in yes. terms of generating <laughs> <Yes>. equations. <laughs> I think he's going to go with math ML now. But anyway, I, I thought that was really informative. Where he said, "Look, part of the effect here, at least, is that they've taken the heavy thing that's around the edges, which is you know when you're picking up a phone, there's like some inertia, and the amount around the edges is 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 going to maybe create more of an effect in your hand yeah. than if it was uniform throughout. And the fact is the edges is where all that stainless steel was. That's now titanium, which is much lighter. And so either way though, the bottom line is I picked it up and I went, Whoa, uh, it is lighter. And I did not expect to feel that way. And I felt that that was useful. And yes, then there was a whole dialogue about the physics of it that involved a lot of math. I was told there would be no math. <laughs> So, yeah. so, so you know, the, the, the actual email. weight, the mass of the phone is nine to ten percent less in grams. Less. But Dr. Drang, using math, points math. out that it, it, it's called the moment of inertia, and it, it makes sense when you handle a phone. You don't just you don't just put it in your palm of your hand and weigh it. You you're you're rotating it around, and it's the yeah. it's the weight on the edges. So he says because of this reduced weight on the edges, the rotational, the moment of inertia, the rotational inertia is 14 or 15 percent, which would be much more noticeable than 9 right. or 10. Because you're moving it's, the edges more right. than you're yeah. moving the center. Yeah, and, and that makes sense. And the easy way to think about it is it's like a lever. You know, if you have a lever, the longer yeah. that lever is, the, the that that weight is going to put more pressure on it. And that's all you're doing. It's, it's really, uh, this was a good piece. I I thought that was, that's that's going deep i hope dr no, no. drang got a tim hug he, he's yeah he's so he's so great i uh, i I've, I've met the internet's mysterious snowman dr drang uh he's a he's a now retired just retired um mechanical engineer oh, well, who specialized yeah. in in failures actually like <laughs> you know a, a light standard falls down or a bridge is collapsing or something and they bring in dr wow. drang to to analyze the failures and do all and probably he probably also doesn't just do failures but anyway it, and and then the apple stuff is his hobby and so it's a, it's he has extra skills that most of the pundits myself included do not have yeah. i mean i took college calculus okay i understand a little bit of math but i see his equations i'm like Whoop, forget it Bye. Yeah, that, that's what that's why specialists are so valuable it's like there is there is someone who knows exactly like he also knows exactly what kind of titanium this is what the welding process to aluminum must be like that whether whether they did anything innovative in the construction process or not and how it actually becomes completely relevant and and one of the thing unique things about apple is that uh, I don't, with a lot of other companies, you would think that that would be maybe a happy accident. They decided to switch to titanium for just to make it lighter. And then, oh, wait, hey, wow, reviewers are actually saying it feels even lighter than it is. Hey, bonus. Whereas you've kind of, you've kind of feel as though with the, as long as they're not making a mouse, Apple really figures out how does this feel in the user's hand? <laughs> can, how can we, can we, can we make this edge a little bit more defined to give them, give someone, make it nestle inside the crooks of your fingers a little bit better? Or do we want a rounded edge there? Uh, and that's, that, that seems as though that certainly comes through. Have you seen the ad? The, the ad is so over the top, but it's so much fun. The, their titanium iPhone ad. Have you seen the... Oh, there's I, one I, where it's coming from I watched space. Football this, space. Yes, I watched football oh, this yeah, weekend, yeah. Alex. I saw it's, it 90 exactly. times. And every time. There was one point. <laughs> so YouTube TV now has this new um, feature where you can watch four games at a time and just move the audio around. You know, if, you, if, you're on the, if you have the NFL ticket, you can just move the audio to whatever game you're wanting. When, when, when it's not Monday Night Football and the Steelers are playing, I'm just watching a bunch of games. We watched a bunch 
bunch of Steelers games. I got to tell you, we've already seen the Steelers play twice now. Yeah. <laughs> but the, they, there was one point where on all the games this, this ad was playing, it yep. was just in different levels of sync. Oh, that's, that's the best shot right there. That shot right there going through the Saturn's rings was just yeah. the best. Let's go back. Let's go back. Wait, wait, wait. It's just like, so this is the, the theory is, uh, the premise is, this is where titanium comes from. I don't know oh, if this is accurate, so but beautiful. titanium comes from space as a meteor. And then it all comes okay. from space. Yeah. The other yeah. part that's really good. I should do, a, the other part that's really good is when it goes through this, the, 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 um, the subsurface scattering going through the clouds. It's really is well just done. Super. It's real. This is like when you have all the money to do something just totally. <laughs> well, absurd. it also is when you have a brand because the first three quarters yeah. of this ad doesn't mention Apple at all. You don't know I what know. you're watching. It I looks was like, like a sci-fi like, yeah. sci sci movie, right? That's Here, right. Watch, watch it go into the clouds. Watch it go into the clouds. Oh, but you, but right. you, you, you oh, also, you also right know there's like, it off. right there. It was right there. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I say there's a, there, <laughs> somewhere somewhere in some like edit suite in Cupertino, there is a version of this where like the, 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 the when they start talking, it's an entirely different message. It's like, what if a meteor causes a, an extinction level event on the planet? You'll be happy that you had an iPhone with emergency <laughs> services yeah, exactly. to save your people from the from As the long as the satellite right survives. You won, you like the one where it's going into the clouds? Is when that it goes you? into the into the clouds it's just like this oh well like you just usually hear it like oh. as it goes through it just it just gives it yeah, and we're not playing you know, the sound because apple's very picky and even though we're showing an ad they will right. pull us down and i don't want they, to. they um it, it, they didn't do the classic because it's, it's a little bit of an old trope but the classic powers of 10 shot because usually when we did <laughs> shots like that i used to do shot i did a couple commercials with shots like that and you have to build the shot where it's where you see the whole earth coming up and you go through the clouds and now you're coming in close up and then we finish mm, it with I a jib shot shots. now a yeah. drone and right you yeah. zoom in it's the zoom i love that by the way uh the internet tells me that titanium is the ninth most abundant element on earth it's almost always present in igneous rocks and the sediments derived from them it occurs I, in I the think, minerals. You know, you know, the ad was amazing. I think you'll find that the Earth itself was formed from a protoplanetary <laughs> disk in space, and therefore all titanium, it's, like every other element, comes from space. It does, well, but it's it, there when the Earth forms. It doesn't come in later. I Some guess. of it also comes in later. Oh, as, perhaps as, Apple as, is sourcing meteorite mm, only material for its I mean, titanium. As, 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 as you funny. as you all know, as you all know, the very first uh, villain that was able to actually fight <laughs> Iron Man toe to toe was titanium. <laughs> A man oh, who had an yeah. armor made out of titanium uh -huh. speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. Stan the man, he, you know, ti you know, Apple, not all that innovative. Stan the man, he had that. He he stole that from artists in 1968. I, I, I have to say, speaking of internet nerds, <laughs> uh, to TechCrunch's Hajay John Kemp's, who did the math, he said if you had bought Apple stock instead of iPhones every year since 2007, you would now be 147 thousand dollars richer. That's great, but you would have no phone. But you'd have no phone, phone to do with this information. Yeah. Who are you going to text saying, look how rich I am? Uh, yeah. And, Maybe. If, and if I spent all that money on all of the winning Powerball tickets since 2005, <laughs> you'd have nothing. I would be able to buy and sell Elon Musk. <laughs> um, 147,000. I mean, it's not, you might say, oh, it's millions, but no, it's just 147. Not a lot. No, not. no. The iPhone, the, the big gains, you need to go back in time. First, so invest that money in a time machine and then go back then, and buy Apple stock earlier. Then. 12 and 7 eighths. That number is imprinted on my mind because that is the stock price when I decided that I can't invest in Apple no matter what, it exactly. would be immoral, unethical, and probably illegal. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I have, I had, I, I figured out how many shares I could buy, but I said no. That if I have illegal. Apple stock, it is in a uh, mutual fund that I yes. am not managing in any. It's way. in a lockbox. Yeah. All yep. of my, all of my money is, and I think I'm glad I did this. Is in uh, Vanguard. And I'll tell you this, young people, Vanguard uh, target retirement funds where you say, well, That's I'm going to retire in 2025 or 2030, uh, 2030. And then you just don't look at it. And I, I imagine there's some Apple stock in there, but I'm, I don't know. <laughs> and I, and I don't, I'm not attempting to improve my retirement by promoting Apple products. Right. <laughs> and so if you're young, it's, it's got more risk. And as you get yeah. older, there's less, and less risk in them. Forget, the you know, my, I, I know so many people who pay financial advisors and I always say, if they were so good, why are they working for a living? <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, just put it in low cost. I just love helping people. You yeah, cynical, that's it. Sure. Ones. I'm rich now, but I still work because I love you. Uh, put it in low, low, low load. Vanguard's very good. 
uh, it funds that Tiger Retirement funds exactly. They re they rebalance it every quarter. You don't have to think about it. And then magic, as long as the economy doesn't collapse <laughs> or we get hit by a giant titanium meteorite, uh, you'll have something at the end of your life. It's okay. It's very light. It won't hurt too much. <laughs> Here is an it's excellent article from Petapixel. Uh, talking about the camera, because I think we all agree I Justine's not really wrong when she says it, it's a camera now as much as it is a phone. Well, I mean, that's all I was waiting for in the, the keynote. The whole keynote, I was just waiting, okay, what's in the camera? What's right. in the camera? What's Me in the too. camera? Me too. That's nothing right. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. It, I mean, look, it's always a good phone. It's always a good internet device. It's always a good messaging device, but it's the camera. Well, and, and I also think that with the watch, I mean, to go back to the watch, I think that Apple's working really hard on this. I, I really become conscious. I've been really studying about glucose and if they if they crack that, oh. that's a big like. There's, there's I don't. So, what is it? 114 million diabetics in the country. Yeah, but it's beyond diabetics, sale. it's going to. For everybody. Yeah. The impact that it's going to have is going to make what Atkins did to donuts look right. like a walk in the park. That's right. Because when people see, I was you know I'm I'm about to get a one just to, just to, I don't I don't have diabetes. I just want to see. No, what I have my blood continuous doing. glucose meters. It's fascinating. And, and when you start to see it, you start, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine that when he started to use it, he was just like, I started eating differently. Like I just yeah. looked at where my spikes were and I'm like, you know, I don't feel like doing that anymore. Right. And, and, um, and being able to have the math changed everything. And so I think that I, I felt like they're working really hard at it. They didn't quite make it work. And so all we got was pinching, <laughs> like, right. but they're, but they're probably a year or two. Well, away it's hard from to that. do. And I, think it's, and I think, I don't know who this was. Maybe it was Jason who pointed it out or, or Micah. Uh, don't expect the same data that you get from your glucose meter because it's not going to be I like that it's not i don't anymore, think it has to be right it's going to be a more general uh yep. trend instead of I, actual I, numbers I, I think that that's all it needs to show though i think that it'll change people's behavior when tim cook talks about it, their biggest impact being health having a glucose that's meter yeah, is great. going to change just with relative like hey you're high and you're, you've got a high glucose like yesterday during the football game, it told me like four times you're seated and you have 120, 120 <laughs> minutes. I'm that like, was a, okay? by the way, kudos yeah, to you. I'm thinking about you the whole time on Monday Night Football. <laughs> kudos to the Steelers. That was a hell of a game. And the Browns yeah, who played. But that is such, you guys are brutal when you play. That is smash mouth football. Wow. That's well, two teams that played the same way. Is, yeah. Is, is it was hard, brutal. Hard to watch. It was hard to yeah. watch. Yeah. But 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 it was but anyway, but a good game. It was, it was, very, but it kept on giving exciting. me warnings throughout the second half of, sure. of like your heart rate is really they were, high. There were four or five lead changes in the yeah. game. I mean, yeah. it was. <sighs> yeah. There was a, actually speaking of blood glucose, I didn't I didn't put in the in the notes, but there's a, a Bloom, uh, excuse me, uh, German says that there's a, a new chief of the team developing the watch's glucose tracker. Yes, yeah, Tim uh, Millay, who Millet. I've interviewed yeah. a couple of times on my Upgrade podcast, really smart guy, very involved in the Apple Silicon transition, and this is a. Uh, it is a silicon challenge. It sounds like this is a this is all about like hardware and getting the hardware and the sensors to all work together and doing you know some machine learning based analysis and because it's it is the idea that you've just got a sensor that's sitting on the back of your wrist and looking into your skin to see the blood flow and somehow being able to based on those sensors determine your well, blood glucose yeah, from it your jets a because huge task. it is not it may not even be doable i mean at this it point not. It, it's all speculation i, I think yeah. Yeah. there's well, a, there's yeah. at least a 50 50 chance they just you know if they it. if they just make if they put a little pin prick into our watch then it'll be it'll be perfect well, well you'll, you'll see when you get your glucose meter it's put it yeah. is it is intrusive it's right. putting filaments That's what I'm in saying. but people are nervous when they put it on but it doesn't hurt it's like and yeah. it's a little irritating that it's there but it, you know mm -hmm. you get used to it um, but it's still sticking yeah. stuff into your skin <laughs> i think i, yeah. I my understanding the, is that Apple is fairly confident that it can be done in the sense that you can take like a room sized sensor and look through the skin and do a lot of processing and you can get a result. But the problem is we're not going to carry a room size sensor around on yeah. our wrist. So yeah. the question is well, not like, can it be done? I think they've established that it can be done like placing something on the skin and getting a result but can you get that in a watch right yeah. like can you fit it there that's the challenge and tim Millay, you know having worked on the apple silicon team and this is all this group has been part of the chip team all along johnny shruji's uh, chip team apparently 
I, I think it's a, I mean, part of it is that there was a death, right? The guy who ran this yeah. team died late last year unexpectedly. And so uh, they need, a, they need a leader for it. But I think it's fascinating because it sounds to me like it is about executing um, because it, right. It does seem like maybe this will never happen, but if, if, I think the payoff is so great if it does happen that it's worth the investment. Yeah. German, German had a report that says that uh, they actually have it working on a device. They, he, they says it's quote the size of about the size of an iPhone. That, so they've, they've, they've got proof of concept or at least, at least for what they intend that sensor to do may not actually be like the intrusive center sensor giving you an actual reading, but something more like the, the heart rate monitor or the activity monitor that says, Hey, is this is, there's is an, this is an interesting trend. You might want to have this checked. If you, if you actually, if you have an actual glucose monitor, they might want to check this out. Uh, but, and the, 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 he's also saying that they're thinking years, like a few years away, three, four or five years away, if they, if they manage to pull this off. Off successfully so it's definitely not a reason to not buy <laughs> not buy a new apple watch because by the by the time the watch you buy this year is you know, you know <laughs> get, gets it goes it goes to the land of uh, ghosts and winds uh maybe this glucose monitor will be there it, but, but but once again I, I, I will always say this every time apple has another really cool breakthrough uh on uh, on fitness and on the apple watch health tracking it still Ask the question, gee, dudes, now you actually, with with iOS 6, 17, now you actually have the health app on my iPad. Tell me once again why I can't buy an Apple Watch and have it paired to my iPad and not and why I'm still required to have an iPhone for this. If, 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 you, if you really want to help me out that badly, it's like, why are you making me switch? I'm, it, se it seems like now that they've got more of that stuff that that's only a matter of time. It feels to me yeah. like the, the iPad connectivity for the Apple Watch but, um, it's got to be coming because now, yeah. now the health kit's on there. And I think this is where you really see the power of a really large company. They're doing a really hard thing that's going to cost billions and billions and billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. They're probably going to generate a couple hundred patents as they go through it. And for a lot of people, they're going to buy that watch because it's the only watch that can do that. It won't matter. Well, you know, they're not looking at the designer, whether you can pinch or whether you can do anything else. And I think it's, um, as I've done more research around glucose, I think it's much bigger than you should worry about your sugar levels. It's literally just being conscious to what your food is doing to your sugar levels. Um, and that's the reason I'm putting a glucose monitor on it, just to take a look at it. Um, and I think that when people have relative measurements of that, it's going to change a lot. of. It's going to, I mean, it. if I was in the uh, food, you know, ultra processed food world, I would be super concerned if it gets closer to yeah. the surface. <laughs> well, when did you just, get one? Just, uh, because uh, my experience having worn a monitor and doing before that pinpricks for now five years is the body is a complex organism. It would be nice yeah. if you said, gee, I ate that donut and look at my blood spiking. But it's kind of, there's a lot. Mm -hmm. It's not yeah. as obvious as It'll you think. I agree with you. It's going to be revolutionary. There are athletes now who wear continuous glucose monitors uh, for training purposes. There's lots of reasons to keep track of it. I wish it were as simple as, gee, I'm not eating those donuts any, any, <laughs> well, anymore. Well, yeah, most of it, most of it is, is common sense. Like, you know, you already know, sugar is probably bad you absolutely you. already know. <laughs> so so, so look, it's, let's it's face it, like, sugar is poison and yeah. they've been feeding but us I, poison for about 30 years now. And we have a massive obesity problem and this will become obvious to people. I agree. Oh, yeah, come that's on, all Neil. Look, look at it. the food pyramid. It wouldn't, be, it, it wouldn't have made the food pyramid like that with the, with the, with the best experts in the food selling industry. And how do you get better experts than that? Well, the, no the, answer. The, do you? the funny and thing I, is, is that the, what really opened my we were talking about it on a forum and, and someone said, well, what I didn't didn't realize is that if I eat white rice, I get a I get a harder hit than if I eat ice cream. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, you know, it was, that's it was, actually you know, like the that revelation a, is that, you, yeah, there yeah. are stuff you think is not sugar that is absolutely getting converted to glucose the minute you you chew it. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah. you know, white rice is one of them, bread, pasta, all the things yeah. I like the best. You know, I always thought yeah. I was virtuous because yep. I don't like all sweets. best stuff. But yeah. all the best stuff is actually carbs, pure That's sugar. The best. Yeah, refined Convert carbs. Convert it right to Chick sugar. Yep. I, I, chickpea pasta. That's all I'm saying. Oh, God. I'm sorry. <laughs> Life is too short to really eat chickpea good. pasta. <laughs> so good. <laughs> That is really, I'm sorry. Chickpeas are fine in salad. <laughs> so well, let me, actually, let's take a break. And then I want to get back to this Petapixel article because they did it. They interviewed uh, two of the Apple executives uh, who were responsible for the camera engineering. John McCormack, VP of camera software engineering, uh, was one of them. And they explain, I think, in very interesting ways 
what what Apple was thinking and what you're getting and and uh, it may not be immediately intuitive, you know, but we'll talk about that in a, in a second. Uh, yeah, that's always fun when the new iPhone is here and and nobody has it yet. I'm surprised, Jason, that they didn't give you one. Were they all? Oh, I, I am very rarely on the embargo list uh, for the iPhone. I'm a, I'm a second wave reviewer, yeah, which is right. honestly, given that iOS, iPad OS, TV OS, watch OS all shipped yesterday. That's a lot. I, we have just I, gotten started because that's right. We have to talk about anything. iOS 17, <laughs> iPad OS. 17. I would have died, Leo, if I also had to do embargo <laughs> yeah. reviews of two different, that's a good three point. different, four different phones. Like, no, no, yeah. no. So I, I hope to get them uh, in the next couple of days and and be able to start my work. And it really, it's sad to me though that the the real what's really happened is that the YouTube guys have really taken over this. And and I'll be honest, I think yeah. it's because they're easier to manipulate than than you know John Syracuse. Well, it's, for, it's, for, they've got for the, an audience, yeah. though. They've got a real audience. Well, I mean, John Gruber still got it. Matt Panzerino still got it, right? Like, yeah. I'm sure that Austin Mann got it. And I like, but it's they, fewer they and fewer have, of those, and more and more. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I think YouTube audience numbers are deceptive. Let's put it that way. Not that they're think, wrong, yeah. but they're not. That's not the same as somebody reading an article. I'm sorry. It's, it's also easy. Uh, I, I won't get. I won't. I won't delay the, the the ad anymore. But it's 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 all. It also, it's also about who is I, who is Justine reaching? Who is Marquez reaching? That's who right. is Jason reaching? That's right. And it's all. It's really all a plan of attack. That, that's why. Like you get kind of weary when you see people like on social media saying, "Oh God, what a." Jason, Jason's got to be pretty upset. I wonder what that. Wonder what he no, did to piss off no, Apple. No, like, no, 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 it's, no, it's no. not. It's not a. It's not a merit based system. It's not. A, you know. Don't, exactly. Do not. Do not ask. Do not try to figure out what the what the meeting behind the Sphinx's riddles are. And the iPhone audience is known only to this. The, the, the iPhone Sphinx. audience is so different from any other audience, right? Like. I, yeah, it doesn't bother me at all. Like I said, I'm actually kind of relieved because I have to do my OS stories anyway, which I think are in some ways more important because fewer people do them. But um, but the iPhone audience, it's so broad. The demographics are different. They want to reach those in different areas. It's just a different PR plan of attack. And it should be, right? It should be a different right. plan of attack than a Mac, a new Mac. Like I always get a call when there's a new Mac, right? Which is very nice. That's a better fit anyway than the iPhone. But um, you know, I'm, it's not like I'm just not, not in their review program. Just a it's tip. Fine. If you were to sell pink iPhone cables, you might do better. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. Oh, boy. Boy. <laughs> don't even get me started. We have an ad to do. Don't get me started about the colors. I don't like the colors, also, but like, also, that's also, later, later, later. Also, to be fair, if I if I worked as hard as Justine does, and if I were as oh, good and talented and editor it. and an yeah. on-screen presenter, yeah. I would probably do better. Yeah. She, no, I'm, she absolutely... Yeah. Earns it and just because she has signature. I just deem pink. She's gone all in on pink. By the way, she was very pink at the event. You probably could see her a mile away. Pink is the thing. Branding. We love I Justine, so we're not. Come on, that's I'm what Marquez Brownlee could do better, right? Is uh, he's just more pink. He needs more pink. <laughs> we were. I was in, I he's was doing in okay. Like, I was like in film tools, and I came around the corner, and she's got like a whole section in film tool in in L.A. In, I know in, it's in amazing. The shop. Was, yeah, the wow, the I Justine what, collab. But it shows you, you know. I mean, I think that they, you know, uh, Justine and, and, and Marquez Brownlee and, and others have really just figured out how to how to communicate that and package it in a way that it gets out to a lot of folks. Yeah. So, and but what's funny is is that a lot of times the articles that we read are things that inform people like Justine and Marquez, and that's what they're reading before they sometimes when before they do a lot of those things. And so those articles still become important as far from a impact perspective because a lot of creators are looking at those. Secondarily, um, yeah. Yeah. Tell Before that to the people who write the articles and are getting paid a tenth as much, however. It's I'm only you know, a little bitter. I'm only well, a little bitter because all the ads are also following uh the, Apple over to those guys. The and, form the form always, you know, the, the 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 form always leads the function. You know, the we right. there was a lot of great actors in 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 uh before talkies that couldn't make it. Yeah, you know, like it was like the the world changed and they were they didn't have a good voice. I'm feeling so, so I'm they, feeling uh, like one of them right now. Oh, <laughs> oh, the rain in Spain falls mainly on the plane. Our show today brought well, to you by, I want to talk a little bit about Discourse, so our sponsor for the hour. Yeah, the online home for your community. Well, and to be honest, the online home for our community as well. We love Discourse. I've been using it for some years, ever since Jono Bacon, who is the king of community, said, you know, Leo, you really need to have a place for your community to gather 
That's twit.community. It's running, if you've used it, it's running on Discourse. And as somebody who runs a Discourse uh, instance, I got to tell you, this is the way to go. I've run many forums in the past. Nothing better than Discourse. For over a decade, Discourse has made it their mission to make the Internet a better place for online communities. The, by harnessing the power of discussion, and by the way, this now includes real-time chat. There's AI built in. Discourse makes it easy to have meaningful conversations and to collaborate with your community anytime, anywhere. If you want to create a community, go to Discourse. D-I-S-C-O-U-R-S-E, discourse.org slash twit. We've got one month free for you and all self-serve plans. Trusted by some of the largest companies in the world, Discourse is open source. That was important to me. And powers more than 20,000 online communities. Whether you're just starting out or want to take your community to the next level, there's a plan for you. I wanted managing managed hosting because while I, w I was happy to moderate our community and run it and participate in it, I didn't want to have to worry about the server end of it and all that. And they do such a good job with their managed uh, server. Uh, it's I, just fantastic. I get suggestions uh, from them automatically about how I should configure it, how, things I could do to improve it. Uh, it... it it really makes it very easy to manage it. There's a basic plan. If you want a, a private invite-only community, very, it's all very affordable, I have to say. Standard plan if you want unlimited members and a public presence. There's a business plan for active customer support communities. You'll see a lot of companies, a lot of projects use Discourse for their support. For uh, Jonathan Balava, who's a developer advocacy lead at Twitch, that they use it too, says Discourse is the most amazing thing we've ever used we've never experienced software so reliable ever that's something to be said for that because forum software in the past has been notoriously <laughs> problematic shall we say but discourse is rock solid secure fast easy to use and i really love the hosted versions one of the biggest advantages to creating your own community with discourse is you own your own data you always have access to all of your conversation history and be reassured, Discourse will never sell your data to advertisers. That was very important to us, that, that our data, our, our users were protected and private. There's no advertising on our twit.community page, and there's no, there's no spying, and there's just good content. It's a, if you want to comment on any one of our shows, that's, that's where we put you know, the comments section, because it's easy for me to moderate. I wasn't going to let the uh, YouTube comments <laughs> take over. Discourse. It gives you everything you need in one place. Make Discourse the online home for your community. There's Jono himself. He's the guy. Visit discourse.org slash twit. Get one month free and all self-serve plans. Discourse.org slash twit. This, I can give them my highest recommendation. We've been very, very happy with our uh, Discourse run. The server's run by them. I don't have to think about it. Discourse.org slash twit. Okay, here is, uh, I think, a really good article, a uh, good interview by Petapixel. This is kind of the deep stuff that I always look for. Uh, of course, they did get a, an interview with uh, an Apple executive, so Apple definitely gave them the information they wanted. Apple explains what the iPhone 15 camera can and can't do and why. They point out that a Apple is very clear that they want to make it simple they want parents taking pictures of kids who are moving fast or pets or whatever to be able to uh, use the, the camera on their phones without thinking about it. But, of course, they also get uh, a lot of interest from creators and, and, and photographers who want to use the phone in a more professional way. So Petapixel says Apple has stuck the same general philosophy when it comes to photography. Get out of the way. They're quoting John McCormick, vice president of camera software engineer engineering at apple he says it really is in my mind all about allowing people to go chase their vision this goes from the harried parent of a toddler where their vision is can i get my kid in the frame as they take their first step all the way through to a pro or a creative who has a very specific artistic vision in mind and wants to get there as quickly as possible uh they're talking now about these dedicated prime lenses they, they explain why they can't do it in video. It, they can only do it in, in stills because computationally it's just too hard when you're capturing uh, 60 frames a second to do all of that. Uh, they talk about log. He says that they will offer LUTs uh, when the phone ships on Friday, which is great. Um, 
the he said that Peter Pixel asked him how the phone is choosing exposure when recording in log. We go for a middle ground expo exposure, says McCormick. When you go into log, there's no tone mapping, so you can have more precise control over what your exposure is. It's also noted that while Apple expects the ProRes log encoding to be easy to grade, they will provide LUT profiles to editors on September 22nd. No, no, by the way, that I don't necessarily agree with what he just said. <laughs> oh, good. I just want to make sure. Like, yeah. like the, the, hey, we're going to leave it in logs to give it, you give you a more precise control is usually the harder thing to do, which is that you need to have a lot, uh, you know, to see where your exposures are after the lot is applied because the log is going to look all washed out. And so, so it's really explain hard to, to me actually... what log is and what a, a lot, a lookup table does. What, what are we talking sure. here? Yeah, so the um, so the log is is a raw. We have linear and log, and so linear is you know it basically is going linear from black to white. So if you think about your curve that's here, it's going straight up like this. You know, um, a log is going to usually it's going to go something like this, like it's going to curve. And what happens is is it protects, um, and oftentimes it can actually be. Um, you know, so it's it's going to go slowly up. It's it's slowly up here, and, and the curves are so your your both your blacks and your whites oftentimes are, and especially your whites. That's what we're really paying a lot of attention to, are protected because what was just a handful of of fact um, of pixels or 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 light levels um, are now a a very um, gradated. So it, it's it's this nice soft curve that goes over. And so that's how, you know, some version of that log and the problem with log is that now they're talking about ACEs, but the problem with log is really that the that it is different for everyone. Um, you know, so uh, everybody's version of log, it's not it's not a known thing. Um, now, the, the issue is, is that you then have a LUT. A LUT is a lookup table. And what this is, is a conversion process that goes from. Um, I'm taking from this color space, let's say Rec 709 or log or whatever to this color space. And it's literally, if we if we think about a curve, when you're looking at a curve in Photoshop that looks like, let's say this, this is your input to your output. It says, you know, if, if it's straight like this, it says the input equals the output. Like it's just, we're not making any change. But if you took your curve in Photoshop and pulled it up a little bit, it means my input's here, but it's coming out brighter than it was before. And so, um, so that curve there, what a LUT is, is doing that curve in 3D. So it basically builds what we call a cube, um, which is, um, and it can be 33 points or 66 points or, um, but the idea is, is that you're pulling these little, these little control points in 3D where X, Y, and Z represents RGB. And you're basically making that conversion from, I have a value coming in and a value, and that conversion is going to be the value going out. And, and so the LUT is the lookup table and it's just a, pile of text you know just it's literally just the the transforms of of at every point let's say let's say it's a lot of us work with 33 point systems for live um and in that 33 points it's just making those those um distinctions anyway it's so, like a parametric equalizer on your sound you've mm -hmm. got all these bars you yep. say well turn it up on this color value turn it down on this color mm -hmm. value etc yep. et what and, are you and, turning and, up and, and down the saturation the hue no you're tr you're, you're changing the, it's not saturation or hue it, well it can be but really what you're doing there is it, it, that affects it but you're moving the rgb pixels when a RGB value comes in at this level. I want it to go out at this level, and there can be, and that can include things that will in, uh, change your contrast, your saturation, your depending on what the LUTs are. But it's really converting from one color space to another. And oh, so, interesting. So, okay. so basically, it, it, it's the conversion between these different color spaces. So if you have log, for a while, YouTubers were using log as the final thing, and everything it looks washed, washed out. out, right? Yeah. It was because they got all these cameras; they didn't know how, well, they didn't know right. what that was, and they didn't know how right. to fix it. And now, but now we've gotten much better at, at having. There's lots of tools, and there's lots of LUTs that you can download that that work inside of that. And so then you can and you can build your own LUT. So for instance, you can take something in log, take it into Resolve, build a color profile that is that's that's what I want my shots to look like. And save that as a cube file, which is going to be your LUT that's going to now convert all the footage to the, to the same thing. So, so once you find so something a, you like, you can make it that way. You can you can buy ones, yeah. But um, but or you can or you can make your own look by by doing those things. And so um, you do want basic lot. So you basically you want some basic lookup tables so that you don't that the average person doesn't have to think about it. So you're so gonna that's have, important when you shoot in log. You don't you oh it's like shooting in raw. You always will have to post process. 
You're never going to just. <laughs> Some people don't, but I mean, you should. You want you to. should program those And, and it's my understanding that one of the main points of shooting in log besides control is that you get a broader dynamic range because of it. Well, is that right? Because it's it's because of this curve. Because what's happening is is that if you if you if, again if we look at this if we look at our curve and we look at it from the side and we see this the, the, our value when we go up like this instead of going like this see the 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 we're we're there's a ton of values now that are sitting in this in the bright range because it's not moving very much as it goes across as the inputs go across so as these come in it's not just going straight out they're coming in and they're and there are lots of gradations now you need to shoot in 10 bit to do this because otherwise when you stretch this back out to represent the hdr or whatever that you're doing um or or, or if you when you stretch it back out to regular color if if you do it in 8 bit you end up with no data so the first thing you have to do is, is be able to capture in 10 bit to make to actually make log truly work um, and then what, what I presume the iPhone does this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, so anyway, so the, uh, uh, so the, by having this curve, you know, gradate, you know, go across a long distance of inputs to have a very ch small change in outputs. What you're able to do is you're saving up all of that. It you're getting more information it and then, but then you have clip. to choose what to use. This doesn't. Right. This doesn't clip up here because it's, right. it's, 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 it's that soft knee or that curve. Well, that's the other thing. Really knee, uh, curve. And, and actually they, Petapixel asked him that because one of the reasons you might use log is to maximize the dynamic range and to be able to get more highlights without overexposure, mm -hmm. without clipping it. Well, that's the big reason that you want log is so that you, you, you have that data later so that you can always stretch it out and throw it away, but you'd like to keep it there right. uh, if you can. And, um, and so the, uh, but but it, you know the problem again with it is that if you you often want to look at your LUT because if you only look at log when you're doing the exposure you know you may it may be really hard to get back to that in in a in the LUT that you end up using ah so 709 may not hold on to that data right. or maybe really hard to hang on to that data so um, so I you know usually I prefer when shooting to um, I well. A lot of times with shooting, I have a what's called false color. So I'm turning that on and taking a look at it. And what that does is it's a LUT, but it's a really, really harsh LUT that tells me these things are going to black and these things are going, going to be overexposed. And I'll flip that on while I'm working just to see whether I'm, you know, depending well, on what I'm doing. Just so what I can, you need. So I can capture that. But then I'm I'm usually looking in a LUT. Now, oftentimes I'm looking at a LUT that's usually a PQ 2020 or not PQ 2020. Yeah, PQ is what I'm, I usually work in or HLG. Um, but the... But 709 is the most restrictive because it's it's a, it's a much smaller. And, um, it, and this is a perfect into. example of why Apple has these automatic settings. So you don't think about this. Well, yeah. here's the worst part. I just explained to you all these things and all the things that I wear on a camera. And there were a couple of times when I went to my kids, um, uh, you know, their recitals or whatever. And I just picked up my iPhone and hit record and I recorded the wrong thing. Like it was Ooh. just nuclear, you know, and, and it was and it just didn't come out correctly. Right. And. What I thought to myself is Apple should not be in the business of making a complicated camera. Put all the features into it. But when I pick up my phone and I hit the camera app, I need Apple to just do all the things that shoot the best image Even that you. can shoot. Yeah, yeah. Even I make mistakes. I think currently the Apple camera has too many buttons, like too many features. Like when I pick it up, I need more of it to be. I get into the states in the phone. Like I'll hit something. I'll get into a state so in the phone that I don't know why. It remembers it and it goes back to that. It doesn't automatically well, go back to the. Phone. Yeah, set whether it remembers it or not. Yeah. Actually, in the oh, camera okay. settings. And and it, and it, and so I've gotten into these into a couple states there, and I've also get into where I hit something. And I don't even know what it is, but I end up in the state where I can't get back to a photo, video. You know, like it's you know, it, and <laughs> I've been in that state. It's the promo, you know, and, and you're like, <laughs> where am I? Like, what am I doing here? <laughs> yeah, you're just like, ah, oh, you know. And so so the um, so I think that Apple. What I really think is really interesting about the new phone is really the interaction between, uh, and I know this is my, oh, this is my pick, but but the the interaction between the Blackmagic camera and the phone camera, because I think that what Apple needs to do is allow the Blackmagic camera to take advantage of, or other cameras, whether it's Filmic or others, keep on going down the path and give them all the subsystems to do everything that you want, but take, but you know, I almost feel like Apple has to go to a simple phone app um, to, to say, if you're going to open up the phone app, it's just going to shoot great photos. Maybe that's what the solution is, is to have Apple's app 
be simple and use filmic or something like or the black magic camera and yeah. so you just know or apple off as you said apple could offer too a uh, 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 well and that was hard to say when when filmic had a subscription that was non-trivial you know right. for a lot of folks to pay it's different now that black magic has a free black free magic's one. free yeah <laughs> so, so it's free but what is their what is their value for them what they get get you to use Resolve market impact or? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Market impact. I mean, it, it opens directly in resolve. It goes to the black right. magic. Um, it goes to the black magic cloud. It, it does. It's, uh, it is the, I mean, I, I don't, I know I was going to say, I'll talk about this at the end of the show, but what I will say is that the black magic camera did a sh level of Sherlocking that, that even Apple didn't do with Sherlock. I mean, so, it's so because the smart thing, if you want all these features is use, just don't mess with the Apple app. And use a third-party app like the Blackmagic app, and that's where you do the log shooting and all that stuff. That'd be my preference. I think that yeah. if Apple, if Apple keeps on, I mean, I, uh, the problem is putting it into that. When I, I, I really do want to be able to go to a, uh, to a complicated camera and say I want all the control, or I want to go to the iPhone camera and just say I want. I don't want you to, I don't, I, I don't want to think about it. If I open this, this app, I want to know that it's just going to take good pictures and it's all going to be exposed relatively well for family stuff. And then if I really want to go crazy, I want to go to another app that I'd rather have Apple build features, like build all the subsystems that support those features, but not necessarily um, feel like they have to put them into, or at least have an advanced and a simple mode inside of their own phone app that just says, keep this simple and turn off all of the options, right. you know, I can set it in preferences or something, but have it do auto exposure and do all the things that I need to do. Um, because again, it, it's done a couple things, a couple times that I, I, well, if it happens to you, I now. imagine it happens to normal people even more. Uh, mm. It might be that it happens to me because I fiddle with it. Because so you're much. messing with the damn thing. But not people, <laughs> you know, it up, mess with it. Uh, mm -hmm. We should mention that uh, Apple has updated Final Cut Pro motion compressor and iMovie to support log uh, encoded video on uh, from yeah. the iPhone. So uh, you can use Resolve with a Blackmagic camera or you can use Apple's tools uh, and they should understand it. Uh, yeah, and... And it's it's great. I mean, that that's been it's been getting back and forth in in and out of the zaps has been a little bit of challenge, and I think Apple's really refining that. But this is, I think we've seen it coming. But this and probably the next camera, like the next next year's, really puts this these cameras into. I could starting to really think I could shoot a film in the, you know with these cameras. Well, and you that's know, one could, of the things I think they were going after uh, still photographers too. I, I'm 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 thinking, why am I carrying a, a bag with seven lenses? If I can get all those focal lengths uh, on the phone, now I'm going to try before I decide. Depth that. of field isn't the same. I mean, I definitely right. feel like resolution right. and depth of field and other things are not. I, mean, I brought my I, I brought my camera. Leica uh, Q2 uh, uh, with me back east because I mm -hmm. wanted some really good shots of you know mom and her house and her you know my, and, and, you know the funny thing, it's for me it's it's uh, location. <laughs> I don't like to use my SLR for the number one. The only reason I don't like to use my SLR is that it doesn't save location data. Right. And I search everything <laughs> by when I was somewhere and where I was. And, and, and I missed my Canon 5D Mark IV. It would, it had a GPS mm -hmm. built into it, but none of the Sonys do. And it's frustrating as hell. I really, it's it, it, like, it's, it's, it, I just feel like I'm shooting. I mean, I, I know this sounds crazy, but I'm shooting into a black hole when I yeah. do that because I just don't know when I'll find those photos again. I can you know, pair via Bluetooth. I can pair the uh, Leica with my phone, and it will then feed it into the Leica. But I know it's just too much work. Like, like I what like I know is, if I pick up my phone and I walk around with my phone, I'm going to take good it's pictures, everything. and I'm yeah. and I'm never have to think about it again. Yeah. And and so, so I, I find that you know some more uh, issues uh, that you might be interested in. Uh, photographers might. This is all from this great Petapixel interview. Uh, photographers might want to know why last year Apple limited the default settings to 12 megapixels. This year, limited to 24 megapixels, despite the sensor, in fact, being a 48 megapixel sensor. Shooting in Heath, the files generated there aren't that large. Photographers might think they should just shoot these higher resolution Heath files whenever they want extra detail. But there are reasons to keep using Apple defaults. McCormick says you get a little more dynamic range in the 24 megapixel photos because when shooting 24, we shoot 12 high and 12 low. In fact, we shoot multiple of those and we then pick and merge. So there's a, you're basically bracketing between the 12 high and 12 low. Yeah. And then the 48 is an extended dynamic range versus a high dynamic range, which basically just limits the amount of processing. 
So that's interesting. Yeah, so you wouldn't necessarily they, know that because just in the little bit of processing time available in the 24 megapixel, we can get a bit more dynamic range into deep fusion. So I'll, I'll finish this and you can, you can say something. So when you end up with, well, so what you end up with in the 24, it's a bit of a Goldilocks moment. You get all the dynamic range, extra dynamic range from the 12 and the detail transfer that comes in from the 48. Also, they're worried about shutter lag. Uh, photographers will get zero shutter lag shooting at 24, which means, which you may not get at 48. Yeah, they have built a whole new pipeline. It's interesting where we got, we talked about last year about the 48 and like, what does it do? And you can right. shoot raw with it and, you know, and then there's a pause and, or you can just shoot the regular and it bins the pixels. And so you go down to 12 and, and it was fine, right? Like you could get a 48 out of it if you shot raw, but like, it was clearly like, not why they were building it. They sort of, that first generation last year, it was really meant to primarily be binned and to use those pixels to uh, generate a better 12 megapixel image. And this year they built this whole pipeline where uh, they're gathering some data in 12 megapixel mode, some data in 48 megapixel mode, building a 24 megapixel image out of it uh, you know, so many captures at many different resolutions. And then that's also why they've got these new um, new modes that they are zoom modes between 1x and 2x, right? It used to be sort of like 2x was the center of the sensor, 1x was the whole sensor, and that was it. And this pipeline now, you can stop basically anywhere. They've got presets for different focal lengths, but basically anywhere between 1x and 2x, you stop. And it's going to use that portion of the sensor at, you know, of the 48 <laughs> megapixel sensor and run it through its whole pipeline and generate a 24 megapixel image. So they built, so when you're between 1X and 2X, they built this whole system to get a really super optimized image out at 24 megapixels, even though, you know, you're not you're shooting with a 48 megapixel, but you're not, you're also shooting with the 12 mode. And like they, it, it's amazing to see how much more complexity goes into the shot now than it did last year because they built this whole, like, it's like the software for the 48 megapixel sensor kind of wasn't there last year. And it is now. Plus now you can shoot a uh, heat at 48, which you couldn't do before. You could only shoot a raw. So if you're somebody who is like, I really want the extra detail here, you can do that without having to post-process a raw file that's enormous. You can get can, a... Yeah. Can you lock it to 48? Yeah. In fact, there's a new control okay. in the camera app. It's a toggle. You turn on their like extended formats. It's hard to talk about it because it's sometimes it's resolution and sometimes it's uh, format and it's kind of all both together it's a floor wax and a dessert topping but basically <laughs> you turn on this option and in the camera app you'll get a little uh toggle and you can set it and if you tap and hold you can choose what which toggle it is and you can choose between heath max which is a heath at 48 raw max which is a raw at 48 or raw 12 which will give you a raw using their pipeline right. for the binned pixels and you can turn those on and off or toggle between them at will you know, i just couldn't find on the last operating system or at least the last time i tried it i kind of just gave up on 48 i was really excited about it for photogrammetry and i just couldn't get it to not automatically go somewhere like i get too close to an object or i do something else and right. it just switches lenses and, and then it loses it and i was just like okay here's the deal i need you to stay on the same <laughs> lens same lens yeah. 48 megapixel and I will move the camera like, well, you know, and I couldn't get it to do that. I couldn't get it. And it was so frustrating. I just, I gave up. I was like, I'm tired of being angry. I'm going to go do something else. It's <laughs> super telling that it used to be like, no, no, no. Macro mode is automatic. We just flip you into macro mode and users were already like, no, let me tell you when I want macro mode or not. And this year it's like seven different lenses. One of which is macro mode. Like yeah. they're like, yes, macro mode is one of the modes that I might choose to be in. So I mean, they really, it is, it's funny. It's like they built the 48 megapixel sensor in last year and we're like, yeah, we don't know quite what we're going to do with it. And this year they totally know what they're doing with well, it. Well, hopefully, hopefully I can lock it in because I, I almost wrote an application with ChatGPT of all things. Um, <laughs> to just, just I, I almost wrote an application that just was like, here's the, I just lock it on 48. Like just use this lens, lock it on 48. Do not change do, ever. Like I don't care. And all I need to do is add it to my photo thing. I just don't, I don't need you to do anything other than just, just give me a 48 megapixel image. And it yeah. was just, 
And you, and and you're you're kind of spot on. One of the most interesting parts of this uh, of this conversation that uh, Peter Pixel had with uh, McCormick was to say explicitly about well, we're trading the line between like the majority of our users who just want to press the red button and get a beautiful picture, but also creating a platform that people like you are going to try to push to the limits and use it as a really full featured camera. So he's he's saying explicitly that there is many times that we decide to pull back and say, you know what, we're going to leave that as a third party opportunity for development. We're going to let the developers exploit the hardware in ways that we don't think would be necessary. That would be that would th things that would be confusing for consumers, but make sure that it's that the uh, the development process is there so that uh, an Alex Lindsay can create the <laughs> shut up, do what I tell you, 48 or go to hell. Yeah, well, <laughs> the and, camera. and I think that the problem with them adding too many of those features into the iPhone, there's two problems with the, there's a balance, right? That, that yeah. you want people to see those things. The problem with adding too many of those features into the Photos app is that it eats into those specialty companies that want to build something that takes full advantage of your hardware because they don't their their market gets smaller as you make that photo app bigger and it also is more confusing to use. So I just feel like Apple could at this point really pair back on that they won't because you you can't take features away. But but I feel like they I would love for them to stop adding things to their own photo um, system and allow third parties to build up more of a, you know, take more advantage yeah. of the platform because I think that they've made the, I personally think that the iPhone app is too complicated. The, the photo app is too complicated, but yet not enough. Like it's, it's, it's gotten into this world where there's too many buttons and, but I still don't have the control that I was asking for. And so maybe this will be the new, I mean, I'll, I'll have to test it, but it's, and it, it works with the, the older phone too, right, Jason? Like it's just iOS 17 that's giving you that, that control. Yeah, iOS 17 will work on the on the uh, last year's Pro phone um, yeah. with those choices. Obviously, I'll, there's I'll more stuff baked into the camera system on the 15 and the 15 Pro than mm -hmm. on the 14 Pro. They, I, I asked Apple about this, and they basically said, like, because because it would be easy to look at the 14 Pro and say, well, wait a second, that's got a 48 megapixel. Is it doing the same pipeline? And their answer is no. That they view the 15 and 15 Pro as having a different camera system that does some different processing, but some of the stuff like like choosing between a Heath or a RAW or a RAW yeah. and 12 megapixels is covered on the 14 Pro as well. And when you really think about it, this phone, like between stereo, 120 millimeter, and all of the processing that it's doing, it's potential, you know, it's one of the most complicated phones, <laughs> complicated <laughs> cameras by itself that's, you know, that's out there. Yeah. That's so should people I, I, just forget shooting in 48 or, I mean... No, I mean, well, so here's the deal. I, I don't think that 48 makes a lot of sense for most people. Um, if I could lock it, and which I'm going to now test after talking to Jason, I just gave up months ago or, <laughs> or whatever, or a year ago. Uh, if I could lock it for photogrammetry, for those of us who do photogrammetry, it's absolutely necessary because the phone, all that, all the computational photography oh, breaks turn that off. Yeah. You cannot have it do anything. I need the picture that the lens right, saw, right. you know, and I, and if I change anything that's a in highly that area, specialized use, I mean, uh, it was, yeah. I mean, you know, like it's, it's now becoming more and more of something that people are doing as they get ready for uh, AR and VR and everything else. We use it a lot. And, and I know it sounds like a specialized use, but it's only specialized because the tools are still a little hard to use or they're, or their, their business model is weird or, or something because the idea that you could take, like um, when I'm 3D printing something, uh, oftentimes I will take do photogrammetry. I'll just take a bunch of photos, like 30 photos of the thing that I'm going to build an apparatus to hold. That comes in, I set the scale, and now I can model around it in my, in like Cinema 4D, I can model around it. And now I know exactly what, I can everything fits to it, you know, rather than making measurements. Um, and so, but it's, and and it's really not that much work. I'm not doing much technically. I'm taking a bunch of photos at a certain angle and then I throw them into a box and I say, make me a 3D model and a 3D model pops out the other end. <laughs> so so it's not, so, and as these tools are getting easier and easier and easier and Apple's building those tools as well. So right now, photogrammetry no longer is something someone has to figure out the math for. It is literally a library that is sitting in the phone that, that people can be grabbing onto. So I think that, um, uh, you know, it went from us being specialized to us using it all the time is you know, there for just previous so jason uh I'm, I'm looking at what you pasted into discord is that your recommendation for how you should shoot oh no what i paste in discord is the pop-up when you tap and hold when oh, you okay. when you turn on the extended settings option in the camera app you you ch get to choose whether you shoot in any of these 
by default, and then it's a toggle. So you choose Heath Max or Raw Max or whatever, which is great if you're somebody who's in a scenario where you want the extra detail of, of the 48 meg- megapixel camera for whatever reason. Right. You can you can just say yes, turn it on now. And and on the iOS 16, it was just Raw. You turned on Raw on a 14 Pro, and you got a Raw 48 megapixel image that was enormous. Right. That is like 100 megabytes. And now you get a you could shoot a Heath Max at forty eight, and it's it's like a, a tenth the size, a fifth the size, and it's still a forty eight megapixel image. You turn that off, and you go back into Apple's pipeline, which on the fourteen is going to be a, a a twelve megapixel image, and on the fifteen it's going to be that twenty four where they're doing the bracketing at twelve and the res and the you know the color data or whatever from the forty eight, and they make their magic. 24 out of and so that. this is like i just did this with my keyboard i mean just taking pictures down on my desk this is the problem that i had i just put it i, I put max on it you know i, I held down um it's still it's still it, taking it auto switches megap- it it's still to, auto switching to to macro 12 megapixels well yeah to macro or whatever but it's auto switching instead of like i just want it to not give me any other choices use that lens give me 48 so still i'm locking it to it and i'm still getting you know, I'm still getting the same problem, you know, so I have it, I pushed down, I held down, I get, um, I c- selected raw max and it's still shifting lenses, which means it's shifting. Um, it's, you know, it's now what? Yeah. So anyway, still <laughs> the same problem. <laughs> Don't be an Alex. <laughs> well, it's just, I, I just, uh, you know, there's got to be some, Don't I mean, literally I would the pay, <laughs> if they just, if they put out 40, if so, I'm just putting it out there for all of our listeners. If someone created something that just said just 48, just call it just 48 and it just does 48. Then you use that for your photogram. $10 and and you never have to change your settings. Yeah. yeah, (laughs) Just Just 48. Well, in fact, that's what they say in this interview with Petapixel is we're counting on third party developers to add you know, these, these features that we don't, we just don't want to make our app too complicated. Um, is there, are there, I mean, look, I, I don't, is, is there a, a recommended standard setting should use Heath max to get the five megapixels, 24, five, five megabyte, 24 megapixel shots. Is that the one to choose? Do, or what you choose is don't choose Heath Max, right? Don't, don't, do, tur- don't even turn on that feature and you're okay. going to get the 24 megapixel regular. Heath Max is a 48. It's basically saying, don't put it through your pipeline. Give me, grab the 48 and then process that as you would any other Heath, but at 48 and then, and save it out. Now, um, what the, that's a, that's a, a pro feature basically it, without that, they're going to do the, um, on the 15s, they're going to do that super resolution 24, which is what they're doing normal people like me want, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's what you want. Cause they're going to do the bracketing on the, on the 12 megapixel sensor shots that they do when you take that one picture and then they're going to do, get other data from the 48 and they're going to blend it all together using that pipeline that generates sweater mode and all the other things that they've got like in the special sauce that they they cook up and then they output a 24 that is uh you know from multiple shots and sometimes they're processing it in the background after you shoot it so you can go on to capture another shot but like until you're done because they're doing so much processing it's pretty amazing what's going on behind the scenes if you ever have that moment where you shoot something and then you immediately want to share it and it makes you wait that's why it's actually it doesn't actually have the photo yet it needs to finish processing it before it can give you a final i i i uh i just want to say don't don't make the app i figured it out so it's the little (laughs) it's the little um in the new one at least uh, in 17 it's the little flower in the lower corner i don't even know what that is it's macro mode what it's macro mode oh so you just turn it off yeah you turn it off and you set it to max it's a setting you have to like turn set. on the setting to have the macro mode switch but once you turn it on then you you have the ability to just go no no so flower turn, not now yes so so if you turn on for the max raw or or, or hype and you or he for whatever and you turn off the macro mode you will get it's, it appears to be 48 every single yeah. time. You take a yeah, picture. because macro mode doesn't use the main camera. Macro mode is using right. the, um, the wide. ultra wide. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's not a it's not a 48 megapixel sensor. If this all right. sounds familiar, by the way, this is essential. I mean, there isn't that much difference between the iPhone 14 Pro and the iPhone 15 
Pro. In fact, uh, according to the Petapixel, Chris Nichols doing, uh, by the way, an excellent review. He is one of the people who did get the iPhone uh, day of and has been shooting with it ever since. He says, this is the same camera with, with two differences. One, uh, you've got uh, the 120 uh, millimeter lens, the equivalent of the 120 millimeter lens, which is using that that those prisms to do that extreme zoom. He says he likes that for street uh, and the coatings. And he says, although uh, Apple says these new phones have updated coatings, I didn't notice much of any difference between the Pro 14 Pro and 15 Pro. Uh, you know, in terms of flaring and so forth, it's it's not particularly better. So. Uh, there are, but there are some things to, to think about. He says, I was skeptical about the 28 and 35 millimeter quote lenses. He says, because they're digital crops, uh, they're not really lenses. So don't, don't kid yourself on that. But he said, eh, despite all that, the, the image quality was very good and it's nice to have the compositional help. Um, so, but you might not right. want and, to necessarily set important. it to those. Another important factor here is you might say, well, wait a second, if that's the case, because it's true, it's a 48 megapixel sensor. So when you're zoomed in more from 1x, it's not using the whole sensor. Right. It's still using, it's still not a, it's not a digital zoom, right? It's an optical zoom in the sense that it's still using a, a sensor. But what you don't want to do is just take the full thing and then crop it later because the pipeline is based on your zoom at the time. Ah, so you will important. always get a better, if you zoom in halfway, so you're at 1.5x and you take a picture versus taking it at 1x and then cropping it. The one you zoomed in on will look better because it goes through Apple's pipeline knowing that that's the desired output. And it generates a 24 megapixel image based on that zoom level between 1x and 2x. So you should not try to outwit Apple's <laughs> system, right? So there like is a there difference for there. A reason. The, cop, the, the pipeline, the computational pipeline is different from the 14 to the 15. And improve. Yes. In fact, it's, one of the they things call, he they says. They call it a different system. Yeah. yeah. One of the things he says is that the faux K is much better. <laughs> the actual, the actual, <laughs> the actual shallow depth of field is most convincing we've seen on a smartphone so far. He says mm -hmm. it does really well with, you know, things like Halo, uh, hair, Halo, and so forth. Uh, so, so that's good. That's the portrait mode, basically. Uh, strange yeah, halos around the face and issues with wispy okay. bits of hair are handled much more realistically than we've seen before. Uh, should note the 120 millimeter lens does not give a very shallow DOF on its own depth of field on its own. So that's, that's good to know. You might want to use that portrait mode and get that faux K. I love that. I'm going to use faux K from now on. <laughs> I love that. Um, so this is a good review. It's worth, it's worth reading. He's a pro photographer, so he's getting great images. Um, I, I kind of wish Apple would go into a little bit more detail when they give these presentations because there's a lot of stuff that I kind of flagged like when I was taking notes during the during the event saying, okay, so you're saying that you're doing it's, you're, it's you're, you have seven different virtual lenses. So are those like click stops when you pinch and squeeze to zoom in and zoom out? Is it just cropping? Or are you actually doing something significant to make me think that, hey, I want to keep this at 40 millimeters for this for this task I want to give it to? Yeah. And and the, and this this that's why uh, I, I guess I'm to answer my own question. That's that's probably why they make uh, ex executives and engineers like this available to ex experts like the team at Petapixel to actually get this information out there. But there's I, I thought there was some miss. Some so there was some missing information in the presentation that uh, needed to be in there. Uh, Nichols says, in my opinion, the real big change is the new 24 megapixel HEF files. You can only get these images with the main camera, whatever crop you're using, 24, 28, or 35. However, these files make full use of the HDR color space and combine a 48 megapixel file using Apple's photonic engine to give it effectively double the megapixels over the previous iPhone 14 camera. The main significance is this new file type. Majority of users will be shooting this, and the extra detail is absolutely noticeable. If the intended home for a finished image is social media, maybe the benefits will be minor, but for anywhere where you want to crop in tighter, display on a larger screen, Zoom in while viewing the file. The advantage is clear if you're doing pixel peeping, in other words. Going forward, I think many users will appreciate the benefits of this new format, and they'll get these three different FOVs to use. So the, so it sounds like he's saying you should use the 24 megapixel HEF setting, right? Unless you want bokeh or fokeh. <laughs> 
Um, then you'll use portrait. Uh, I actually, I, Jason, what do you think of the uh, new action button? I really like it. Uh, I feel like there's more that could be done there. But um, in my experience, like, first off, I am one of those people who always left my phone in silent. So for me, it doesn't I, matter. It You're not losing use, anything. It was useless, right? right? And now you can just do that in Control Center like you could on the iPad. You can just put it in silent and then use that button for anything else. So if you use it for camera, uh, not only does it bring up the camera, but it is in that mode. It is also the shutter button for the camera. So you can just leave your finger there. And That's what I think picture. I'm going to do. I think I'm going to make it be the launch yeah. camera and shutter, although it's in the wrong place for the shutter button. It's on the right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah to, but it's, yeah. it's a thing that if you're if just trying to be quick, right, you yeah. leave your finger there. But it's yeah. the only case where the that button press does something else. Otherwise, it's just in this mode where there is a, you know, press and hold. And it makes a haptic, and then it kicks off something, something that you said. But hey, look, I mean, for anybody who always left it either on or off, that uh, ring silence, which was completely useless. Yeah. And if you do want that, it's still there. You can't feel for its exact position, but if you toggle it, you can tell based on the haptic whether you're going in or coming out of silent mode. Yeah, I, I, also, I also think it's a big positive move that it's no longer the ring silent switch. It is a but a function button that you assign a specific task to because I think that to this day, there are people who are surprised when their phone starts, their iPhone starts making noises in the middle of a theater or the middle of a live production. Cause Hey, I had this thing switched to silent. No, no, that's not the silent button. It, it will, it will, it will quiet certain things, but not all things. And that took a lot of people by, uh, by, uh, by surprise. Um, I also, I also have to correct, uh, admit that I said something wrong last in the, in the heat of the moment. I forgot, I forgot that the, uh, I, I said that, Hey, it's going to be great to be able to attach like shutter actions to like that function button. Uh, yeah, I forgot. I, I forgot in the moment that, yeah, the volume buttons, uh, for forever have acted as another shutter button yeah uh, and a lot of accessories yeah. also take advantage of that but i'd love i'd love to see what can be done with this now that we have a dedicated button not just a simply convenience feature but this can be you this can be something that is has the uh, the the behavior of a shutter button including uh, set, uh, 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 set up a target for focus and exposure, lock targeting exposure, then recompose and complete the and complete the button press in order to take the picture. Um, there's there, there's there's a, there's a lot to love about that. Did you love the action button animation that the the setting? Uh, I haven't seen it yet. I've only seen videos of it, but it looked pretty pretty darn cool. Yeah, they went. It's extra, right? Like yeah. they they did. It's like animated and stuff. And they've done. They do this occasionally now, where they they really like a new feature, and so they want to show it off. And so it's got a lot of extra. Uh, you know, remember like they used to. There was one time where they did an update with the trackpad gestures on the Mac where suddenly it was like all movies of all the gestures <laughs> yeah, and you're like what? Yeah. wow this is a lot but they they were they thought it would be helpful yeah Whoa. so it's it's you know you're swiping through and they show the various things and their little effects going on in the background but but it, you know Andy's right the the potential here it's literally what can you think of because it does shortcuts and you might be thinking I mean yeah nerdy shortcuts are going to happen where it's like I press the button and my shortcut detects what context I'm currently in and then does a different thing based on the context that's true, but iOS 17 also added app shortcuts, which are basically pre-baked shortcuts for functions in individual apps presented by the app developer. So you could set it to shortcut and then just go to your favorite app and it'll already have like shortcuts to do app, you know, tasks in that app. And you can map those to the button as well. So it doesn't have to be like a super nerdy thing for it to still be useful. Yeah. Uh, I want to take He's a little break because we have so much more to talk about. But uh, before I do, let's uh, anything else about the iPhone 15 before we move to iOS 17? You did a very long review, Jason. I'm glad you so did. Much. And we're going to talk about it. Anything else? It's a nice phone. It's a nice phone. Colors. You don't like the nice colors, camera. Jason. You said you hate the colors. No, oh, uh, yeah. Well, the 15, I mean, again, I just really quickly, The um, I don't know what's going on uh, with Apple's feelings about color. It's hard to believe that the company that released those brightly colored M1 iMacs is the same company that released <laughs> these things because the Pro phone, I mean, I know they learned their lesson, I guess, with that blue and white g3 back in the day that like pros don't want color in their workspaces for whatever reason but um so those are four shades of gray right you can get it in any color yeah. you want as long as it's a shade gray. of gray yeah. and then the i i kind of feel like with the 15 what they did was they did this new ion deposit glass process that somebody <laughs> traveling salesman came in and said here's a way to color glass <laughs> and it's 
super light and subtle and all, and all, almost like an Easter egg that only got dipped for a, you know, it didn't get the full three <laughs> minutes. It only got like one minute in there. And so it's all pale. It, it's a cool effect. And on the camera bump, it's actually, it looks really nice, but it's like, they're barely colorful. My wife was buying, shopping for her iPhone 15 and unbidden, not knowing that I was ranting about this on a podcast. She was like, <laughs> these colors are terrible. I'm like, yeah, they are terrible. And, and look, I know that not everybody likes bright colors. That's fine. What bugs me is that if you like bright colors, you can't buy one. Because Get a case. they just didn't make them. They, they, you, you got black, and then you got pale green, pale pink, pale yellow, pale blue. They're all super pale. Or you can go to the pro phones and get various shades of gray. I, I just, yeah. I, I have a hard time believing, like I said, that this is the company that made the M1 iMac, which again, came in silver. If you don't like colors, you can get yeah. boring silver. Yeah. It's fine. You can be boring if you want to, but it was also fun. And now I'm starting to worry that the next iMacs are going to come out and it's going to be back to like midnight <laughs> and starlight and be super yeah. boring. So I, I don't know what's going on with Apple's color. Who's in charge of color at Apple? Like Mike Hurley Which, and I call them the color. The colors are who is the colors are. Well, what has happened to the colors are? So has the Lisa, colors are been deposed. Lisa bought the black uh, pro, uh, and I got the natural because yeah. I want. I just want natural titanium. I think that's probably the color to get. But yeah, it's great. It's a gray. It's, it's a mid gray. gray. I got the. I got blue titanium, which again is just a bluish. Dark gray. Well, do we do we think that it all has to do with the titanium itself? Because it's getting uh, co color to bind to the titanium right. is a right. yeah. It's the vapor uh, thing that they did with the Apple Watch. Yeah, mm -hmm. I I think that probably it's a hard thing to get a super colorful titanium shell. Doesn't yeah. explain the fifteen though, right? Doesn't yeah. explain those the uh, anodized aluminum fifteens with the glass back. They have been colorful before, and they just decided mm -hmm. this year they would not be. And it's right. just a bummer because sometimes you like a little color, and yeah. and giving people the choice is fun. And I, I get that Apple likes to be no fun on their pro products for whatever reason, <laughs> but on their non-pro products, they're like, like no, fun. still it, no fun. Is it possibly no that maybe they're going to do, um, you know, next year an S version in effect that will have color? They've done that before, haven't they? I mean, I mean, that's the argument is that it's a style thing. And they're yeah. like, yeah, this year uh, pastels are in. You and have next to, year we'll yeah, go bright to, again. Yeah, it's fashion, baby. Well, I guess. Yeah. It, I don't it, know. It, it may be also just looking at behavior because I know that for me, I get gray, 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 gray. Well, yeah, that's why you're, you're a pro. Black. Yeah, you're a pro. You're a pro. You just want so, gray. No colors. But, I'm actually uh, happy you know, with it, the natural it, titanium good, because it'll but match pros, my watch. It'll match my watch band. Yeah. Titanium is a very dull, it's a kind of a gunmetal gray. It's I, not attractive, but. I think I think the issue is is that all of our apps are all gray, you know. So we we look at them because the and the reason that they're gray is so that so that the color doesn't affect yeah. Yeah. our experience of color. And right. so we all so all of the apps we look at all day are gray. And I think that that impacts how we. Uh, I think it, it definitely impacts what we buy around us because you always want to you you don't want like my your whole office tends to be gray because you don't want it to be again affecting that process. And so I, I think that's why a lot of times. Uh, you get used to that as a as a user, and then pros just tend to not want to have. They just tend not to buy a lot of color. I, I'm not kidding when I say that 25 years ago, Apple really got on the color train with the iMac, and they immediately put out the blue and white G3 and the iBook. And I seriously think what happened in the late 90s is the pros push back on the blue and white color scheme because they're mm -hmm. like, I do color, especially the pro publishers in that point. I do important color work. I can't have this blue in my face. Mm -hmm. It completely changes how I view the color on my screen. Now, how much of that was real and how much of that was just people saying, no, it no, really it does. must be beige, but there is some truth to it. And yeah. then with laptops, I really believe after they did the tangerine iBook and the, and the blue iBook, I think they realize that people who are taking a computer out in the world didn't want it to stand out, that they wanted it to sort of just kind of gracefully slide into wherever they were. And as a result, I think they, I think they institutionalized that in their culture and that they've just decided pro products and laptops should just be monochrome and that's just how they should be. And I don't love it, but I understand it. I actually am excited about one thing about the action button. Uh, it's not available yet, but at some point they're going to make it trans. Have it be translate, which I think, uh, if you travel, would be very interesting, don't you? Now that's not available uh, until later this year. And then the other one yeah. is great is voice memo because that we're back to the day when you can 
Hold up something and press Agent a button Cooper, and go, right voice, from Twin voice Peaks. to self. Yeah. <laughs> Diane, to self. I'm entering, I just purchased my new iPhone <laughs> and I'm entering Twin Peaks. You know, the voice member for me, a lot of times I'll be thinking about something and it is a little bit of a process to go find yeah. the app and everything else. And yeah. what I want to do is just say, I just want to say a bunch of things that are in I my head right now that. and yeah. I don't want to walk away. I'll, I I'll have it on my Apple Watch. I have uh, drafts which will let you record a, a memo and then textify it. But I also have just pressed record. I actually come to think it actually, I replaced that with a voice memo button. So I can do that on my watch now, but mm -hmm. I think it'll be nice to have that on the phone. So I don't, yep. um, maybe we should put four or five of those on there buttons. Yeah, it, it, it would be nice to have that hooked up to Google lens. Just asking Ooh. what the hell am I looking at? Yeah. Whether it's translate this thing for me or identify this thing for me or what is this song? Uh, there's it's it's the fact that on uh, on out of the habit for for Apple it's like hey here's a button and we're not we're gonna let you tell us what it should be for we're not gonna I we're not gonna make this change for you that you have to then sort of deal with because it supports shortcuts I suppose you could have a shortcut that launches Lens yeah yeah yeah, yeah. maybe even an app shortcut that's supplied by the app developer yeah wouldn't that be cool mm -hmm. um, so now I'm gonna have to decide what do I use it for. Because now that you're right, I, I remember I can use the volume button to take a picture, so I don't sure. really need it to be the camera button. All right, let's uh, take a break. Uh, let's talk about the new operating systems. They all came out yesterday. Have you updated yet to iOS 17, iPad OS 17, Watch OS, what is it? Not What do they call it? Nine? Watch OS 10. 10. Yeah. Well, we'll yeah. talk about that when we come back. But first, a word from our sponsor, Fast Mail. I have said for years... If email is important to you, do not use free services. Free services like Gmail, Hotmail, Outlook.com, Yahoo Mail, very poor support. But more importantly, they monetize by showing you ads, by watching what you do. If you really care about email, if you have a business and you want email to reflect you well, if you're per, just an individual who wants to control their email, you need fast mail. It's not super expensive, as little as $3 a month, but you get so much more. First of all, FastMail works with everything you're already using. Apple Mail, of course, Thunderbird, whatever whatever email client you use, it works just fine. Because it's true IMAP. They use the Cyrus server, so, which is an open source server. that They contribute back to the open source community in great, really great ways. So you're using a real IMAP server, which I have to say is, is not Gmail. Gmail is kind of faux IMAP. Uh, you also can use their web-based interface, which is superb. And they have iOS apps and Android apps. In fact, I use the FastMail app on my iPhone as my preferred mail app. It has so many nice features. Quick settings that let you easily choose a new theme, switch between light and dark mode, change your text size without even leaving your FastMail screen. Uh, you can get all sorts of nice features with FastMail. Really excellent spam filtering. Plus, the ability to write your own Civ scripts to further filter your email. I have a very elaborate script because I do all of my email processing in FastMail ahead of time with folders, moving things around, highlighting mails I want to read, discarding mails I never want to see. It all happens automatically, and it's a really powerful uh, solution. You can have contacts auto-save when you respond to somebody. I do that. So I make sure that, you know, they are added to my contact list. Oh, incidentally, I have moved from Google Calendar and Contacts to FastMail Calendar and Contacts and Notes because of all it all syncs with FastMail just the same as it would with Google. But now it's private. It's in FastMail. I'm not giving that information to Google. I just I really like this idea. And plus, you can integrate it with your email in very nice ways. Uh, they use external services like Gravatar if you want to show images of senders. So it's really nice. You can see who's sending you mail. You can set default reminders in your calendar for events you can change how invitations are handled you can turn on notifications for calendar alerts or turn them off you can also buy a domain through fastmail or bring your existing domain to fastmail fastmail is my dns server for most of my domains because i automatically get strong authenticated email services on all those domains i can host my website anywhere else but when you send me email it's going directly to fastmail and more importantly when i send out email on those addresses it's using dkim and and spf all of the authentication protocols to make sure your mail goes through everywhere I really like the ability to send and receive emails from my own domain, to have infinite email addresses on, on any given domain. 
uh, which is really great for tracking who's selling your address, among other things. Not fast mail. And that's what I love about them. And man, the best support ever. Really great support, people. For over 20 years, Fastmail has been a leader in email privacy because at Fastmail, you're not the product. You're not there to be exploited. You're the customer. People that they care about. Advertisers are left out. You're the center of your universe at Fastmail. You pay for free email with your privacy. Don't forget that at Fastmail, your data stays yours with better productivity features. And again, it's not expensive. as little as $3 a month. No ads, great spam filters, superior privacy, the best productivity tools. Oh, this new uh, mass email service that works with Bitwarden and 1Password will automatically create a new pa email for every account. So a bad guy not only has to guess your password, they've got to figure out where your email address is. And all of that email goes in your fast mail inbox. They handle all that for you. That's a nice feature. Very easy to move. You won't have any trouble. Uh, exporting your old mail, bringing it into Fastmail, or having it forward to Fastmail. Fastmail's the best. These people really love email. They know email. Email is all they do. They they contribute to the new internet standards and open source innovations. In fact, if you're using somebody else, you're probably using innovations created by Fastmail. Don't get left behind by substandard email providers who exploit you as a product. Reclaim your privacy. Boost productivity. Get Fastmail. It's all I've used for a decade. It's the best. Try it now. Free 30 days. Fastmail.com slash twit. Fastmail.com slash twit. We thank them so much for their support. And I thank them personally. I thank them for, uh, for giving me the best email service ever. If you, if you care about email, you need Fastmail. iOS 17 is here. Our... Uh, you know, the only well, the one thing I'm I'm looking forward to using is the the business card feature where you tap phones and it passes your <laughs> contact information along. What else is something we should? What are you excited about, Jason? You did a good interview, good uh, review on uh, Six Colors. Um, live voicemail is interesting. What's that? The feature of live voicemail basically, um, your phone answers the call but plays your voicemail message and then at beeps and then transcribes the response so you can see them live lock screen so you can see who you. it is yeah and if you want then you can pick it up oh which turn it um, on that's great freaks people out but it's great for screening calls that what what do they have to uh, do, do know, is do record a clatter up? sound and and you can run over out of breath and say oh 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 i just picked up i heard your <laughs> voicemail so just like the old days just like the old days yeah well the idea app, iphone has this great feature that is hard to turn on which is uh, unknown callers just are silenced and sent to voicemail. And the problem is, what if it is some, you know, it's your plumber who you called and they said you'd call them back. They, they'd call you back and then you didn't put them in your thing and then you missed the call. Like there, there are lots of scenarios like that. So this lets you turn that feature on. And still, if the call is coming in, you get to see uh, who's leaving the message and maybe then pick up and go, oh, sorry, that I'm, I'm here now. Uh, so that's a, a nice little feature inside the phone app that I think is pretty clever. Um, there's standby, yeah. which is this new thing where thing if it's if it's being charged either by MagSafe or even just by a cable, and it's in a horizontal orientation and not moving, um, it enters this standby mode that it basically turns it into a widget display or a clock or whatever, and widgets work in there, and they've got some presets with like photos and the clock. And uh, it's just a, you could basically buy a, a stand and turn your iPhone into a, 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 an ambient data display. And I'm a big fan of ambient data. The idea that I just sort yeah. of like it's around me and I can look at it when I want to. And that's, that's a really nice new feature. Are you using, are you using a contact, uh, what's, what's that, what are they calling the feature where you're going to have your own custom phone, your, contact your, your custom, thank you, contact posters. So oh yeah, I'm going to set that up right away. They, yeah. they, they see yeah. not just your name, but hey, here's the picture I decided that you need to see <laughs> as you're deciding whether to talk to me or not. Yeah, it's, it's basically the lock screen editor from last year. 
uh, turned into contacts. It's the same premise, mm -hmm. right? Where you're sort of, you get a layout screen where you can pick a photo and you can pick a color and you can pick a font. And then it uses the same dynamic as uh, has been around for a few years now where you set a little icon for yourself. And then when you're texting with people, like your icon gets sent to them and represents you if they, if you want and they want. Um, and it's similar in that, you know, if somebody doesn't want to use that photo of you, in their personal on their phone they don't have to but you you basically provide them with like here is my design of how i would like to represent myself <laughs> and it's all via icloud and so you know you end up with it there's a little aspect of delight to it too when you're when yeah. your buddy calls you and you're like hey and it's a picture of your buddy like really nice and big and their face and their their name is up there and it's a color they've chosen and like it's just a it's a nice thing to have it's not necessary um, you have to choose to do it, but um, I think it's fun that Apple adds features like that. Yeah. Um, oh, and and I should say, interactive widgets, right, is a huge one that is across all of the all of the different levels mm. of this. Which is that you know the new the widgets were pretty, but they didn't do anything, right? <laughs> they were just for data, and now they can be like you can't swipe on them, but you can tap on them, and things will happen. So there's like a home kit one where you can turn lights on and off. Our friend James Thompson has already done his dice rolling app where you can roll <laughs> dice right from there. Oh, that's nice. Uh, timery and other time trackers. You you don't even... We're, we're entering an era where for basic app interactions, you don't have to open the app ever if there's a widget on your home yeah. screen. So you, you end up with this interesting case where Apple has sort of like said, it used to be, if you want to use an app, you go in the app. And now it's sort of like, you only need to go in the app in some cases, like when it's something complicated, when it's something simple, you probably never even need to go into the app. You just use the widget and it'll do whatever it is you want. It's There's a lot yeah. of potential there. A lot of third-party apps are going to be, are going to do great stuff with it. That, that, that's going to be transformative for a lot of people. That That's actually one of the things that got me to switch from iPhone to Android way back when, because there are so many times where like with the Notes app, I don't necessarily want to have to tap on Evernote or whatever and navigate through there and to create a fresh note. I just want to just simply say uh, the, the, the the path the the Wi-Fi password at my friend's house is this, uh, and when I'm traveling, I even have like a whole page of my uh, of my home screen set up with just like one two three simple widgets. So it's a status board of where I am in my travels, and also a way to to do actionable things once again like when i'm just i got 10 seconds to get this down or 10 seconds to check this or update this thing i don't need to, be, to have to dig through like 80 apps in order to do it i, th I think that's a really really tr a lot of people are going to find themselves just absolutely digging this to yeah. to, to an extreme extent imagine having your to-do list and your time tracker and you right. finish a job and you go back out to the home screen you could literally check off the item off your to-do list and and turn off or toggle your time tracker and you never opened another app. You just went tap, tap, done, move on to the next thing without launching. I, I think it's going to be interesting to see how much workflows change where people are like not having to open apps. Just, you know, just tap on that widget and move on to the next thing. And the app is doing the work in the background, but it doesn't. It doesn't yeah. have to, you know, do more than that. It doesn't have to be more complicated. Minim minimum intrusion is one of the best trends in modern software. That is, we don't, let's not grab this person's whole attention. Uh, attention. Right. Let's just let him just give me part of his brain for exactly five seconds. We can do the thing that needs to do. And he, we won't take him out of whatever his mindset is right now. And just because an app takes up your whole screen and dominates your life. I mean, it doesn't have to, right? It's only been yeah. that the model has been the app takes up your whole screen and dominates your life. And with these widgets, Apple is sort of saying, and Apple has a, a lot invested in people using apps, right? But with the widgets, Apple is saying, no, you don't always have to have it be your whole life. It could just be a little part of a larger thing. Uh, it, it's it, It'll be interesting to see how the developers react to it, but I think it's a good thing. I should mention yeah. Apple's also completely overhauled the video camera system. So like on the iPad, you can use an external video camera. Uh -huh. They're bringing continuity camera to tvOS so that you can do video conferences oh, that'll be uh, cool. on your TV. Yep. Nice. And they've and they've added this whole machine learning layer. So they take in the input from your camera and then they process it and then they output it to the whatever app you're using. And and it, it happens, that's 
good because it means it'll work in any app. And it also means that they can do, and they're doing like machine learning processing of who the subject is and who the background is, which leads to that whole thing where if you like hold up two thumbs, you get fireworks that happen <laughs> behind you or one thumb and you get a big thumbs up thing that pops up. And that's all across all the oh, platforms. Oh, look, it just did it. Oh. And, and, without, yeah. and without any software at all because it's just happening Rock and roll. in the system. <laughs> that's really neat. So <laughs> it's all there. And on the Mac, you're when not Mac watching the video, next week, Jason's you can, you can even doing like, edit it. That's so cool. Yeah. There's it's and it's and it's system level. I mean, that's the beauty of it. It's not like only in Apple's apps or right. whatever. It's like literally when I'm in Zoom right now, Zoom is looking at a video camera that it thinks is the camera. Right. But it's not it's right. It is a camera. virtual yeah. camera of the same name that is taking my camera's input and processing it and then passing it on to Zoom. And Zoom doesn't need to know any of that. Right. It doesn't need to right. know. Do more, and that's, Jason. It's do super more. Clever. Are there any more? Uh, well, there I mean, are the short depth of field is that <laughs> Apple's like uh, depth of field is better than everybody else's because it's not oh, as aggressive. Confetti. Nice. I really like the rock and roll. You got to make the yeah. rock and roll gesture. Yeah, and you can turn all this stuff on and off in the in control center on the iPad and the iPhone too. So yeah. you can do you can set portrait mode and and studio light and you can also change how strong they are, which you didn't mm. used to be. So are to you do. in continuity cam? Oh, it's raining. This is, no, this is, uh, I'm actually using my Opal web camera, huh? uh, webcam, but it doesn't matter because, again, it's, it's into all in the, the system. It's software system, yeah. And, and that's just how it works. Oh, so, you know. true love. So, yeah. so these are reminiscent of the messages uh, features, but better because you're in it. Exactly. And, that, and it's segmenting based on um, your your position, right? So the idea here is it knows I'm the subject so it can put things in the foreground and the background. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The balloons went in front of you and behind and you. And, oh my God. And, that, and the balloons are translucent too, aren't they? Yeah, they Fine. yeah, they, yeah. they show a little bit. And likewise, the confetti falls behind me and in front of me. Wow. It's, it's uh, yeah, they, they did a pretty good job with it. I got to point it's, out, this is yeah. all looks simple, is not. Yeah. And yes, this you can turn it off. You can turn it off yeah, if of you course. don't like it. You can you know, like because there's always somebody out there who's like, "This is so stupid. I hate it." Like, d don't worry. You can turn it off because that's. I think a lot of us over the last few years have been like, you know, there really should be more webcam settings in Mac OS and iOS. And they're, and they're like, Apple will never do it. And it's like, guess what? They did it. They actually, nice. I guess it's not too nerdy after all. You can turn this stuff on and off. You can adjust how much you want you want that focus portrait mode thing to be right uh you can yeah. do all of that in there now it's a really nice feature yeah i, I'm, I was really pleased with uh, how well the camera worked on on ipad os 17 i got i installed that yesterday and just you plug it in uh, i just plugged in basic external usb camera and suddenly facetime didn't even have to be told don't use the internal uh, camera of the ipad use the use the external instead yeah now um, the, the question is does it deliver that to other apps so like for instance yes. if you're on yep to i to instagram it is a, it, I think it changes your default camera when you plug in an external camera and it uses that camera instead. Because the, the Instagram one is interesting because Instagram won't let you use professional cameras. So being able to not, it's not so much web cameras, but if I can, because I've tried so far with the, uh, um, the iPad, uh, I haven't been able to get my, my ATEM to work because it's supposed to show up as a web camera. You know, it shows up for a web camera for many things. It doesn't show up yet for the iPad. I, maybe it doesn't believe you. <laughs> doesn't, yeah, exactly. But but I think that if we, if, if you know, so digitizers for us, the idea is like, can I give it an SDI or HDMI signal and convert it and have it into one of these like web presenter pros or whatever from Blackmagic? Because again, the Instagram and a couple other ones will not let you do that because they're trying to keep everybody on the same right. uh, playing field and all of us want to break that playing field. Playing field yeah. Wide yeah. Open. I think if it can fool it into thinking that it's a webcam right and it works with a webcam then it will work yep. but those yep. are the those are the tricks mm -hmm. there's a bunch of, I was surprised at how much stuff is across all the platforms this year right like there are some iOS and iPad OS specific features but a lot of them are sort of everywhere iPhone iPad and Mac um, like mm -hmm. uh, I write I write a lot about fo the Photos app. They added pets to the the mm -hmm. uh, machine learning based recognition engine, and it's pretty good. Like I had two black cats, and <laughs> some combination of its ML model, and I think maybe it's using dates as a cue, right? Like that that if you see one cat in this run of years and another cat in this run of years. It's probably two different cats, which it is. And it did a pretty good job of like recognizing the two different cats. Um, and so I, you know, it recognized all my pets and then they show up in the 
in the People album, which is now called the People and Pets album. So they they did some nice stuff there. Um, mm-hmm. And then the other one I'll, I'll throw out there is password sharing. You can use, if you want to use iCloud uh, passwords and you want to share it with other people, you can. And they didn't do it by saying something like, you can share with your family, but that's it. It's like <laughs> literally you create a password sharing group, you put people in it. It can be anybody. Yeah. And then you put the passwords in that group, which is actually really nice because it means that you share this password with, I'm sharing this with Dan and Casey. And then you go to the next password and you're like, now I got to add Dan and Casey again. <laughs> I can create a group with Dan and Casey in it. Well, and, and then they see the passwords and then, and then they get, it's like an invitation and then they get the passwords and they do see the passwords. It's, oh. You are sharing them and then you can, it's a, it's a, you know, you, that's the circle of trust, right? But the, by creating arbitrary groups, it can be anybody. Well, and then you say, you can assign people to those groups. You can remove people from those groups. Uh, it's a really smart, it's, it's a really well done system. There are still re- reasons to use a third party password manager, but fewer and fewer of them over time. Well, the, the big thing with LastPass that we used a lot for a long time was the idea that I could add groups and it would add the password into the web page, but never show it to you so that you would be able to give people passwords without actually showing them the passwords. So you can say, yeah. I want that person to have access to this, but I don't want them to ever know what the password is. And it would just do that um, built in. That was the, and that was a feature because then you don't necessarily want people to see the passwords either. You can, you can give them access without having to, but all of this is going to go away with passcode anyway, because then you'll, you'll yeah. be able to basically say these people can get into it. And yeah, Apple's yeah. whole system is about disclosure. So if you're trying to hide uh-huh. passwords from people, don't give them the passwords. Right, don't give them passwords. <laughs> yeah, exactly. one, one, one thing that really disappointed me was I was really hoping for the next generation of stage manager. Uh, on uh, at least on the iPad, it's still. I mean, they, they made a couple of changes. It's easier to move Windows kind of where you want them to go. But the basic problems that I've always had with it, like how is this going to be easier than simply snapping a window left and right? You're not making it. You're not making it terribly easy for me to have multiple uh, multiple work stages. You're not making it terribly obvious how I switch between work stages. It's like I, I'm 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 I was deliberately trying to see how far I get without reading a documentation on here are the key switch here are the key commands for switching from one stage to another. Here is how you manage apps from one place to another. Hey, why can't I put the window where I want it to go? Well, here's how you put a window where you want it to go. It's, it's, I, I, uh, there's a lot of potential there, but I, I, it's, it's going to be a struggle for me to so, stick with it. And I, I'm determined to stick with it for a little while. I, I don't agree, but I'm not a kind of user who does things like try to snap windows side by side. I'm not, I'm not a snapper. I'm not. <laughs> um, I like to put them where I want to put them on my Mac. I think stage manager for me, it completely fixed it um, really? the, with this version. The fact that you can place windows in arbitrary places. I felt with last year's stage manager that I was fighting an invisible enemy who kept wanting to put my windows in places I didn't want to go. I was fighting with the system and I couldn't, I couldn't survive it for more than like 20 minutes. I'd I'd just give up. I like, I can't do this. And now like it wouldn't let me put two windows where one was centered and one was off to the left. It would be like, Oh, you want those side by side. It's like, no, I don't (laughs) want them side by side. (laughs) And this new system you could put, you can do that and it's fine. It doesn't really rearrange your windows at all other than if it does some sort of like organizational snapping. So if you have one that's sort of toward the top and you have another one at the same height, it will mm-hmm. sort of slide it a little bit so, so that they're it's, it's, level still a target. Yeah. basically, but that's about it. Yeah. Um, and, and they solve the hiding problem, which is uh, you could lose a window behind another window. You can't do that with stage manager. It actually uh, peeks out the back and says i'm back here and then when you click on it it brings it i'm over here i'm here and and in terms of switching around in stage manager uh they added a bunch of uh shift click that works almost everywhere where if you shift click on an app in the in spotlight you know anywhere in the dock it will put it in your space which was a thing that was frustratingly missing last time Mm -hmm. and uh in terms of switching between stages i i'm I'm always with a trackpad. So I just, it's a, it's the three finger swipe back and forth yeah. switches between spaces. And that, that works for me. So it's gone for me in the way I use windows. Uh, it has gone from being an unusable thing to a thing <laughs> that I actually can use all day if yeah. I want. And it works pretty well. Yeah. 
it's just still some confusing stuff. I mean, I've got, so I've, I've, I'm determined to have, I've, I've just, I've established my iPad pro as the desk over there is now that's where the iPad pro lives, always docked to a keyboard and a mouse and a screen. I'm looking at it right now and I'm still confused as to why, like on the, uh, on the iPad screen, I can see the, uh, I can see the, the sidebar dock, uh, uh, what do they call it? The dock, they, they call it the sidebar dock or whatever they call it for the yeah. place on the side of the side of the screen where you have all your different, like uh, all your different views, all your different locations. And I'm like, well, why? Why do I not have that on the main screen as well to affect the apps groups that are up there? And it's and it's the it's it's nice to be able to do all those swipes on the, on the trackpad, but I'm missing like on the maybe it's because I'm just so used to the efficiency of how uh, app and window management works on both Mac and Windows and every other desktop operating system. It's like I'm used to well, why can't I just hit Command? tilde or command escape or whatever to switch because i want the active window to be this now like no you're making me like drift off the keys and put on onto a pointing device in order to actually select this part of it i still I, it's I, I i openly admit and i'm trying to address this that i just didn't get interested in it when it was first rolled out last year so i had it turned on for a few days to play with it and then i had to actually start doing actual work on my mac and on my ipad said okay this is a distraction i'll get back to it later and then i never did and this is why i've got this set up over there i'm trying to keep it active so i can learn it at least from the per point of view of someone who is trying to get interested in this there's a lot of it that just puts me way off as opposed to other features that the first day I've seen, oh my God, I don't understand fully how this works, but I can absolutely see how this is going to save me time and energy. Like, like again, snapping the, the idea of like, I have a, I have limited screen real estate on this iPad. So maybe overlapping windows is going to be more of a hindrance. I like the fact that you don't make me have to sort of carefully adjust how to have, uh, have how to have one app on one half of the screen, another app on the other half of the screen. I like the fact that you let me just simply have a divider and you can slide it between half and two thirds or have it come in from the side i mean oddly enough it's, it might sound like a big step backward but if they added an option for a tiling mode where i can say look i want these four apps on the screen i want one main i want one half of it to be the my editing window i want one column to be this piece of reference i'm pointing at and i want uh, a, a top right corner and the top left corner to be two messaging apps so i can participate in a group chat in two different places that sort of stuff but I'll, maybe i'll get into it Number one feature besides the continuity cam and I and TV OS, according to Andrew Cunningham, is the sixth icon <laughs> in the on the Apple TV yeah. in, instead of five. Uh, okay, yeah, fit more apps. Fit more apps on <laughs> each row. It's most useful <laughs> feature in years, and actually, that says more about how silly TV OS is than this feature yeah. right is just although i i i disagree in the sense that i do think continuity camera is the big win i think there. that's the huge idea yeah. that you can take your phone and one of these mounts like you know belkin makes one that, that you stick your phone on top of the tv and you've got a family like we do those all and it's awkward because it's on like an ipad or it's on a laptop and they're sitting on the coffee table and the angles are bad and I'm telling you, you you do a FaceTime because Zoom, I don't think, is out for tvOS yet, which it really should be. But you do a FaceTime with somebody with continuity camera on top of the TV. It It's like I felt like I was in a science fiction movie. I, <laughs> I, I was like, I cannot believe because like the quality of the image is really good, even using center stage because the iPhone ca back camera is so good. There's yeah. so much sensor there that they can zoom in on you when you still look really good. And the person on the other end looks really good because they're on your big TV now. And the, the, it does the noise canceling thing where the sound sounds good and they don't, there are no echoes. And like, it, I, it's a winner. Uh, I think I, I, I look forward to having all of those family video conferences and all my other video conferences, frankly, be on the mm. TV now because it's such a better mm. experience. Nice. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of hard to know how to expand Apple TV because it it's almost as if, if it's almost as if the entire marketplace has made the decision that this uh, this unremarkable plain little black box that you hide in the back of the TV is there just to run the Netflix app, just to run the YouTube app, just to run the Disney plus app. And it's not something that I intentionally 
experience. So it's hard to find where is the central concierge portion of that experience where one would launch something like, hey, I want to have a uh, I want to have a have a Shlomo experience where it can give me when I uh, when I ask questions into the ether, it can actually display partially partial uh, answers uh, where I, uh, on my TV screen. Uh, it's hard to know, like if how would the use how useful would be would a web browser be? How useful would it be to be able to have a live video window, but also an informational window uh, so I can do live chat with friends as I'm going. I think the people it's it's a cool idea and it is definitely what would happen like when you're phoning home from Clavius Moonbase uh, in 2001 but maybe people are just no all all <laughs> can I can I run Netflix on it? Yes, good, done, sold. Here's your I, money. Here's And as I'd you point out Jason, board. Health App is now on iPad. That's nice. I don't know why it yeah, wasn't. Big uh big good. charts and stuff now and yeah. Health Kit too. So theoretically apps that previously like connected to other health devices via bluetooth and only ran on the iphone should now they have to be updated right because like i i have a blood pressure sensor and it like on the ipad it's like no you can't share this with health because you used to not be able to <laughs> right they yeah. need to fix that because you can now right but the idea there is that if you're somebody who's more ipad centric than iphone centric and andy and i both fall in that camp um yeah. It's really nice that that stuff is not barred from your view. Uh, all that health data now can get yeah. shared a across your devices so that you can go for a run, log it on your Apple Watch, then go look at the heart rate statistics on your iPad. It's all there in big, you know, big iPad sized charts and graphs. And yeah. Stuff. It's it's it's. I mean, the Apple Watch has even got more enticing, not with fi fancy new features that involve like a harder, harder, higher processor, more memory, whatever, better pipeline. They they added three things that really spoke directly to me, like uh, uh, simple things like uh, being able to like track. Uh, have you taken if you're taking vitamins if you're taking prescription medication like have you taken your pills today that's being tracked so you can basically log that yep i took this pill at the, at the right time and if it doesn't take if you don't take it it will make give you a reminder saying hey you probably should have taken it by by 9 a.m it has a uh, has a light sensor so it can track did you get did you were you exposed to daylight not just like harmful daylight but again did you spend the entire day inside offices and inside restaurants and stores or did you actually experience the sunshine and even uh, the, the 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 logging features of just what was your mental health today what was your what was your experience what was your feelings today like like alex said i mean for everything yes for blood glucose uh, levels sugar levels but also tracking here is how i felt day after day after day after day also did you again wow i was in a bad mood on wednesday and i had actually not really left the house <laughs> since saturday the day before the day before perhaps this has a relevancy to why i was in a sour mood and i was feeling sad for three days and also just simple things like again confer some sometimes like i'll i have a pill that i take in the, in the morning as soon as i get up sometimes i forget that i would i whether i took it or not it's the sort of thing where like uh, i can't i can't you, you shouldn't take it twice so it's like okay i guess i just won't I guess I got hopefully I took it if I didn't. Well, it's today. Today's going to be a little bit Anybody more challenging. Anybody install watch OS 10 yet? Uh, yeah. Boy Genius Reviews uh, says major overhaul makes me want to upgrade my Apple Watch. So Apple's redesigned all the apps, right? Uh, everything's a little bit bigger. Uh -huh. This is even on existing Apple Watches, not yeah. just the new watches. What do you think? Yeah, old Apple Watch apps used to be um, black background and trying to pretend, right? Because remember, the earlier Apple Watches, the the face was not mostly screen. The, there was like a little postage <laughs> stamp screen right. and then extra border around it. And right. so they made all the backgrounds black because then you could pretend. It's sort of like with a dynamic island, right? It's like, how do you hide the cutouts it, is you put the black thing around it well modern apple watches recent apple watches have very small back or uh, borders around them so they've they've embraced it and they're like now apps have colorful backgrounds and they're not they look nicer right and they also embraced the idea like complications are a good thing in the apple watch and so now i love that apps have little corner yeah. interface elements that are that look like complications but they're actually like menu buttons and action buttons and Thank things you. like that yeah so the apps are really nice um, and then they added this widget feature, which I, I think it's weird because you have to kind of like scroll off of the watch face to get to it. And, uh, and then the first thing you see is the, is a clock. And it's like, well, wait a second. I was just looking at a clock. If I, 
wanted to see a clock. I could have stayed with a clock. And now you're <laughs> showing me a clock again. Why? And then you keep scrolling and you see widgets. The widgets are very cool. Again, Apple is all in on this next generation widget technology they built. And now you see it everywhere. It's in standby. It's an in interactive widgets it's in, in control center or notification center. It's on the Mac desktop. It's on, it's everywhere. And now it's also sort of a, a version of it on the Apple watch, but it's useful because you can see a bunch of stuff at a glance without going into the app, which seems to be a theme. And uh, I love the scoop that GQ magazine in the UK got. <laughs> I don't know why they did. How Apple made the ultimate Snoopy watch. You wouldn't believe the minutiae. Okay. Yeah, th <laughs> this was this was this was such a good read because you think about you think about the like custom watch faces and it's like oh okay so they so they created a piece of art to put underneath the time right. the, the hands of the time or okay now there's an animation that maybe turns up and says no they created like 134 working very closely with the creative the creative director at the, at the Snoopy's the. The Charles Schultz's estate. It's like 135, 134 different like animations that kick in at That's specific so times. Cool. And the, uh, I'm, I'm scrolling to find it, but they they actually called it like the Snoopy engine to uh. basically figure out the context of like, oh, this person is swimming, so Snoopy needs to be in scuba gear, and here's how we need to rotate this oh animation to, to make sure because he's interacting with the, the minute hand, so we have to make sure we 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 rotate that that graphic in exactly the right way. Oh, uh, makes me want to go that scuba is, diving. That's fantastic. Wow. It's like you really appreciate that. That's that's why I, I I still think I still wish that they would allow third parties to design their own watch faces. But when they put this much effort into a Snoopy watch face, that's see, incredible. Again, th another another reason why. Damn, I really want to have a. I really want to have an Apple Watch, and maybe I'm. <laughs> I, I have. I have like my 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 most recent iPhone is an iPhone 11 that I actually own, like as part of my hardware library. It's like if even if I, all I have to, I I just pair it to that phone just to get it started, and then like I see how long I can go between like actually <laughs> turning on that phone again. It'll be it'll be worth three hundred three hundred fifty four hundred dollars to get like all these little things, excluding the stuff. It will never. I, I don't screw screw widgets. I I just want the snoopy watch face that's it well you'll get it if you get a watch uh i guess i'm getting my new ultras friday along with my iphone 15 pro max we'll talk about it next tuesday um what else is there anything else before we uh, wrap up here i don't i mean there's so much more obviously we can't <laughs> we can't get to it all but i think we've covered a lot of worthwhile have you tried the oh i guess we don't have the new watches yet no i tried i tried it at the uh oh, yeah? at the event the double yeah. tap yeah i it took a it was a little learning curve for me I, yeah. I i think i was tapping too gently and too quickly but once i realized i needed a little more force and a little more time uh -huh. i was able to get it and then it's a clever feature I, like andy said much earlier in this show it's a question of like is this just the accessibility feature from a couple of years ago i I get the sense that it's not and that they did some refining in order to sort of turn it loose on the entire world and that the fact that they've got the neural engine in the in the chip in the Apple Watch this time uh, and they suggested that there's a level of, of um, machine learning that's going on here for them to figure this out that maybe they had to put, they liked the feature and they said we, we want to give this to everyone but we need a little extra, like we need to have mm -hmm. a higher degree of confidence. In right. it. And so they built some new models on it, but it's clever. I mean, it really is literally for when you would, I mean, I think we've all done this probably, or is it just me? Like you, you got your hands full and something goes off on your watch and you end up tapping it with your nose right. in order to get it to go away. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, well, yeah. you won't have to do that. It's now. a universal you experience. And it's, Don't worry. And, 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 and what one. it's trying to do is just, it's hitting the default button. Like it's actually, yeah. it, there, there's not a lot of complexity here on one level. It's literally hitting the default button because I can't, for whatever reason, I can't reach over and tap it. So I'm just going to do this and make it go away. It's sort of like with the Google, um, the nest home where the alarm goes off and you can just wave your hand like there, there's nothing to see you these aren't the droids you're looking for and it and the alarm turns off it's a little like that where it's just it's a convenience where, where you might not be able to touch a touch screen not not worth rushing out to buy a new watch for but something definitely i'm keeping my series six because yeah. it's titanium and it's beautiful and i yeah. love it and it's yeah. fine but it's a but it's a fun feature that i think will be good for people uh whenever they do their next next upgrade whenever that is let's take a little break picks of the week still to come
I have like 12 of them, so I'll have to pick one. <laughs> pick my pick. But first, a word from our sponsor, Delete Me. Uh, have you ever searched for your name online? Oh, I don't, I don't recommend it. But on the other hand, I do recommend it because you really ought to know how much of your personal information is, is out there. Thanks to these data brokers, uh, since 2010, Delete Me has been on a mission to empower individuals and organizations to reclaim their privacy by removing personal data from online sources. And this is not just a luxury in a company. We've had this happen. Uh, if they can figure out who's who in the company, they can use it to spearfish you. In fact, it happened to us. People were able to figure out our org chart, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, people at work got messages ostensibly from Lisa, our CEO, uh, that were really phishing. Fortunately, they're all smart enough to say no. That's when Lisa started using Delete Me to delete her personal information from the internet. The team is driven by a passion for privacy and a commitment to making it simple for customers to use. And again, as a business, this is a security issue. Delete Me helps reduce risk from a, a, not just spear phishing, but identity theft, credit card fraud, robocalls, cuts down on spam, harassment, unwanted communications overall. Delete Me. Remember the name. It's the most trusted privacy solution available. Thousands of customers have used it over the last, what is it now, 13 years to remove their personal information online. Of course, every year it gets worse, doesn't it? Every year you need Delete Me more. The average person has more than 2,000 pieces of data online about them and their stuff that Delete Me can find and remove. You, yeah, maybe you could do this yourself, but it's a lot of work. And the problem is there's new data brokers every day. There's hundreds, maybe thousands of them, and new ones emerge every day. You have to keep on top of this stuff. Delete Me, it's their job. It's their passion. They know. One customer said, I signed up. They took it from their awesome service, already seeing results. That's what Lisa said, too. So here's how it works. You're going to sign up. You, you'd have to give them some basic personal information so they know what to search for obviously, right? Then they will go out and they will find and remove your personal information from literally from hundreds of data brokers, helping reduce your online footprint, keeping you and your family safe. This would be a great gift for a teenager, right? I mean, this would be something everybody should have. So you don't have to worry about what's online about you. Now, once it starts, you're going to get a detailed delete me report within seven days, but it doesn't stop there. They will, and this is important, they'll continue to scan and remove your personal information every three months. And with automated removal opt-out monitoring, they'll make sure, and this is another thing data brokers do, they take the data away, and then a couple of days later, they put it back. Delete, we will ensure records don't get repopulated once they've been removed. And what kinds of stuff is out there? Look at this. Names, addresses, photos, emails, relatives, your phone numbers, your social media. They know where you live and your property value. And they'll sell it to the highest bidder. The data broker industry is evolving. It's getting worse and worse. Delete Me continues to add new sites, new features to make sure their service is both easy to use and is effective in removing all this PII, this personally identifiable information. In fact, they've got privacy advisors that will talk to you. And I think it's important to let you know where it's a problem, where it's not a problem. They'll give you the advice you need. They're experts in this stuff. Protect yourself. Reclaim your privacy. Join DeleteMe.com slash twit is the website. Join DeleteMe.com slash twit. Do use the offer code twit so they know you saw it here. Join DeleteMe.com slash twit. The offer code twit gets you 20% off. I hate it that we have to do this, but we do. And, uh, and you know, again, it's no fun, but search for your name online. See what you find and then visit the website. Join deleteme.com slash twit. Don't forget the offer code twit for 20% off. Uh, let's see here. Let's start with you, Alex Lindsay. We usually start with the least expensive stuff first, but I'll. I'll give you a chance to. Uh, my bust least, I don't think you can get least expensive. So my pick is actually the Black Magic camera. I think that this is a, a pretty groundbreaking camera for the fact that we don't. Uh, this is not a physical piece of hardware. This is soft. This is an app. Exactly. It's an app, and it is. It is. Um, you know the the. You know it's. It, there's a couple things about it. Is is that it's an it's an app here that basically, is the 
Um, it gives you the feel of working with a Blackmagic camera. So a lot of the stuff looks very similar to the Blackmagic camera, um, but it's on your phone and it's taking full advantage of what your phone can do. Um, and not only that, you can set it up to upload to things like the Blackmagic cloud um, so that you can be shooting and uploading, you know, very, very quickly. Um, so when it comes to some of the places this might be used, which is news gathering, imagine being able to have an editor sitting there for mm. breaking news or wow. something else and you're shooting stuff. And the, with your phone with a ton of control and that stuff is just appearing in your bin in resolve <laughs> like it's a it's a pretty uh uh but you can set it to upload to different folders and different things it's not that's not the only thing it'll upload to and so there's a lot of um uh, a lot of power it's really a professional level camera taking is just going well we want all the features all the features that we can get that we would normally have in our cameras and they just applied it to the lenses and the sensors that the phone has. And so I think that the, it's, it's a pretty, I mean, I, I, I will, we have friends that, that, uh, um, you know, have built lots of phone apps and this one's going to be really hard to compete with because it's a big company that I think is playing really hard. They, I think they see this as an opportunity to add to it. It's, you know, a lot of it's lookup tables and so on and so forth are designed to look, to intercut with the, cameras that they already have. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of, uh, really interesting, um, puzzles. I mean, one thing that will be interesting to see is we've already used it through adapters. We've used the iPhone. We've used things like Filmic Pro to connect four or five iPhones to a ATEM switcher, but we have to adapt from lightning to, to, um, you know, from lightning to HDMI and everything else with the new cameras with USB-C, I think we just plug a USB-C to HDMI cable in, plug it into our switcher and we're switching it mm -hmm. as well. So I think that wow. there's a lot of, and what would be really interesting is to see if they figure out how to talk to it so you can shade the cameras and everything else. Wow. But that's, I, you know, I don't know, it seems like a natural place for them to go. They're not announcing that yet, or no, they're not talking about that anyway. Um, but but the, uh, it's free. <laughs> it doesn't cost anything. You can download a very high-end app that that fits into a much larger ecosystem um, at no cost. And so I think that if you've been waiting for that, that app and you weren't ready to pay for something or pay a subscription or do anything else, um, I think it's going to be hard to compete with what, what they just released. Um, uh, they released a lot of other things last week. They released some, uh, new cameras and a new full, full, full frame sensor and uh, a lot of other things. And so they, they, uh, big router, the things that I'm excited about, the 80 by 80 router, which is at, <laughs> at 12 G, which is something that I'm really excited about, but probably won't affect the average consumer Mac break viewer. We use, uh, uh, is if, if we were just talking about before the show, we have their, what is it, John, the 90 by 180 router, 72 by 144, 72 by 144, which they don't make anymore, but the broadcast video, yeah. hub. they don't make it anymore. And we need it. So we and so now we have a legacy piece of hardware that we got to keep running forever because we need it. Right. And and the problem is, is that I, I wish it was a little bit higher. The router, um, the big thing that we've had is we've been stuck with these 40 by 40s to do 12G. And so the next step up was incredibly expensive to another yeah. company, Utah Scientific. And, and so uh, or Ross, one of those two. And and those are really expensive So get, to get 80 by 80 for the price, which I think is under 10 grand is a pretty it's a lot. And um you can buy these in, you, you, they, they have some re replaceable, you know, one of the problems we had, someone steps on the cable. We had one router that was a 40 by 39 because someone stepped on one of the cables and oh, broke Jesus. the <laughs> piece off. Now you can, you can pull some of these out at like, I think 10 at a time. So anyway, that, that's a whole nother, those are other, they made a lot of uh, announcements at IBC, but I think the one that's probably going to impact the industry the most right out of the gate is this little, this little app on the phone that gives you something again, that looks, if you're a black magic camera user, it looks familiar. Um, and it gives you pretty much all the manual controls that you would want well, in a camera in, interface. Just to record up to DaVinci Resolve. I mean, I can yeah. imagine taking this to CES recording clips and as I go, it's getting uploaded to yep. black magic cloud and editors here can edit it and put it out as soon as it's done. I mean, that's, yeah. wow, by itself yeah. is great. And it's <laughs> by free, itself, it's pretty by nifty. itself. So, uh, yeah. that, I mean, that sounds like a killer app and, and all of the other features. Um, okay, yeah. it sounds like everybody who has an iPhone should have this on their phone. Yeah. For, you know, yeah. It, why not? <laughs> if you want to, yeah, you, you should download it and and uh, play with it. Now, it might be more than what most people want right. uh, to have there, but, but if you're, I mean, it, it really is taking you know, going towards a, you know, I want to do filmmaking on the, and remember that this is also, it's going to the, the Blackmagic cloud, but that means you can also use 
uh, resolve on the iPad. So you could be out there with your phone and an iPad and, <laughs> and cutting with your, you know, shooting with your phone um, and having it uh, and then being able to do fast assemblies. So imagine being able to cut then you do a fast assembly on your iPad, but it just saves out and someone else opens it in on a regular one and finishes Amazing. your show. Amazing. You know, so there's the, you know, I think that a lot of us have looked at what black magic's doing for a long time going, I think that they're crazy, you know, like, like they're, you know, what they're trying to do is so big and so complicated and so hard, you know, to get this whole integrated experience. And it's starting to like, you can start to see it off in the yeah. distance now. Like yeah. we were in the black, like, it's I don't amazing. know if this is going to work, but now you're starting to go, well, <laughs> yeah. they might, they might actually pull the turn here. So, so it's a pretty, pretty interesting um, um, amount of integration. I would highly recommend and because it's, it's free. It's not like free for a little while. It's just free, free. Um, I would highly recommend downloading and playing with it. Yeah. Hey, I never asked this, but I should. Uh, the microphones on the iPhone, are they good enough for that kind of gun, run and gun shooting? Or do you really still want to have an extra? Um, you know, I would still use, I mean, you can get something out of them for run and gun shooting. I would still use external still, mics for to it. To me, it seems like they sound surprisingly good, like better than they ought to because it's just a phone. Yeah, I mean they they do a reasonably good job of it uh, at it, and and um, so I I wouldn't say that it's unusable. It's not as good as if you had a if you you know I I build rigs where I have you know electrosonic <laughs> electrosonic mics going into an interface that go back into the phone, uh, but but I think that uh, I think that you could definitely get usable stuff with people that are a reasonable distance away. So it's it's just if they start getting further away, right, if you're moving right. around a lot around right. them, then of it becomes course. a little bit harder. Yeah. But if you're yeah. getting tight. But All right. for like an interview of the two people standing or are you yeah. doing a stand up in front of it, I think good. we could probably get some yeah. pretty good pretty yeah. good audio out of it. Yeah. Blackmagicdesign.com, but it's on, the, of course, the App Store. Andy Anako, pick of the week. Uh, mine's kind of a narrow recommendation. Uh, it's for people who are interested in live theater and or opera uh, and people who are in Boston or going to be in Boston this Friday or this Sunday. Uh, the Boston Lyric Opera Company has put up a really amazing production of Puccini's Madame Butterfly. Uh, and it's absolutely ex exceptional. I saw it on Sunday and it's it's deeply, deeply fascinating because uh, Madame Butterfly is one of those really difficult problems we have as modern uh, progressive people where this is a uh, one of the best operas ever written by one of the best composers ever written it's one of those top five most produced operas with some of the most beautiful music ever composed however it was written in 1906 by an italian white guy and it was it's set in japan based on what that 1906 italian white guy imagined a, a japanese culture is going to be like uh, and on top of that i mean so it's not like it's not super super racist but it's really uncomfortable and also it's i will also say that it's based on this idea of this the, the main character butterfly being this uh, really kind of aimless kind of powerless again like a flitting butterfly who is like from the first act from the overture all the way to the very end it's like she's just walking towards a cliff that she has never any choices never any decisions she's just determined to walk towards that cliff so the story itself is even even when i've seen those uh, really great productions at the at the metropolitan opera house there's part of me that's like okay i'm gonna put aside the fact that again it has stereotypes <laughs> european stereotypes that i don't like and the story is i have to kind of like lock the, the performers really have to do all the heavy lifting to make these characters real they've uh, so they decided to address all of those problems and not in the way where they just say okay well I'll tell you what we'll cast uh we'll cast asian actors and all the asian roles roles great it's fixed no they, that's not it or ne ne neither did they say you know what we're going to make sure that we're scolding puccini we're scolding every person who ever enjoyed this and tell them how wrong they were to like this that's also not the right way to go they made a simple change to the setting uh, now instead of taking place in uh, in Japan in 1900, it's taking place in San Francisco just before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Butterfly is not this sort of waif-like, naive 15-year-old girl. She's a she's a she's a club singer, uh, and the 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 the. The danger of the times, the racism, the culture of the times informs every choice and every decision that Butterfly has to make as she navigates a really, really tough situation. And for all that, they didn't re they didn't really rewrite it. All they did was, again, 
made this brilliant choice and every choice they made after that was informed by this. Uh, what I, what I, I was left thinking that this is this, this is the same story. They just replanted it in fresh soil and that's all. And for all that, it's actually a lot more accessible. It's a lot more easy to understand if you're not into opera, uh, as long as you can read subtitles on the screen, so the left and the right of the screen, you can basically treat it like it's a, any other musical only with, again, some of the most God amazing music ever sung ever performed uh i could go on for an hour i will try not to i will just say that tickets are available for friday night's performance saturday afternoon's performance as low as 40 bucks uh i again i saw it on sunday i'm gonna try real hard to see it again because this just was such an exceptional experience i just want to go through it all over again uh but yeah if you are in boston if you have any interest whatsoever even if this is going to be and maybe in particular if particularly if this is going to be your first opera this is going to be a really, really great experience for you. Go to blo.org, bostonlyricopera.org uh, to get more get more information about it and to get tickets. Please. Thank you, Andy. I'm going to the, I understand Iron Butterfly's doing the next one, and that's the one. <laughs> you know, the, the Ara in Agata de Vida, you know, for the mezzo-soprano. <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, Jason Snell, your pick of the week, sir. Well, my opera this week is <laughs> the opera of the week. You know, I I have that nightmare where I wake where you know you it's like you forgot to turn in your paper in college. My nightmare <laughs> is that I'm on Jeopardy. Yeah, and opera is the first cat. Oh, all of them are opera. Oh god, mine is. And I just walk away. I just leave the stage. I'm like, nope, goodbye. I can't do goodbye. it. Bye. I'm out of here. Can't do it. Football, that, that's the one where you're allowed to touch the ball with your hands, right? Hey, the, po hey, the pointy ball? Don't be intimidated. <laughs> Ken Jennings, that's, a Mormon, is a teetotaler and yet did very well in Potent Potables. I just want to point That's out. right. He studied, he studied suspiciously well, bartender one might say. stuff in order, to, in order to get it. That's, part, that's one of the tricks. In Potent Potables, yes. Um, not an opera. It is an app. And, hey, do you live on Earth? Well, then you might be affected by <laughs> seasonal wildfire smoke blowing oh, in and ruining your air. Uh, it happens. It happens to all of us in the U.S. It's been happening in Canada. It's been happening a lot this summer. There is a uh, network of little tiny air sensors out there called Purple Air. I have That are some. relatively cheap. Yes. Yes. I've got one in my backyard. Yep, there, there are a couple in my neighborhood. Uh, in fact, when we had some real severe wildfires a few years ago, I actually wrote a JavaScript widget that queried my local air, Purple Air and had a little thing that sat on my iPhone and my iPad that told me what the air quality was outside. Oh, that's funny. I made a web well, site <laughs> with yeah, my, yeah. With my do Purple it, Air. You do the queries yeah. and you set it up yeah. and all that. Yeah, well, yeah. guess what? Uh, Paku for, uh, the, uh, for the iPhone and iPad, P-A-K-U, Paku, is an app that does all of this. It's got the purple air map. It's got uh, you can have it locked to the a station near you. It's got a great widget. It's got a new design that just came out where it shows you sort of like re a chart of what has been going on in your area recently. So you can say, oh yeah, we had a spike earlier today, but now we're coming down the other side. Just incredibly well done. It does one thing. Honestly, talking about widgets earlier, this is one of those things where you might just be able to set it and forget it. Put the widget somewhere oh, where you can this. see it. We need and this. It's based yeah. on location, so it's whatever sensor is near you. There's probably, now you might, if you're a nerd like me, you run out and you buy a purple air sensor and you put it in your backyard. But the fact is, you should go to purple air first because guess what? Probably somebody oh, they're all over. already did that. You don't need to build your and own because they've got one just around the block I and will, it's close I will enough. add to this because this was back when we had the wildfires and the AQI and I was looking at the air quality. I thought, that's wrong. The nearest official government sensor is like miles north of us. They're not yeah, all you over. Can't, yeah, so they're you, very accurate, more accurate than Purple Air, but they're too far away not your from neighborhood. most people. And, and, right. and the smoke and all that can be incredibly hyper local. So you got to. Yeah, yeah, but if there's one near you, you can just use that one. And Paku is just, it's a beautiful, it's free. There's an in-app purchase for a bunch of Love extra it. features. Really well done. And we'll, and I now I regret having written that JavaScript because, you know, who needs it? <laughs> it's garbage. This is an actual real app. Yeah. And uh, I recommend it. Yeah. Paku.app, P-A-K-U dot A-P-P. -P. Paku for purple air. Yeah. I wish I had an iPhone because I would download this right now. But Jason, that's always, that's always humbling, isn't it? When like, you yeah. know, oh God, there needs to be a solution to this. You know what? I'm a programmer. I'm going to program and you're really happy with it. You're really proud of it. So you know what? Maybe I should, maybe I missed my calling. And then a real professional programmer attacks the same problem. You're like, ah, this yeah. is better. 
This yeah. is yeah. much that's better. Fi- it's I'm fine. Glad I, I mean, I'm glad when I'm I wrote my widgets, <laughs> the app wasn't out yet, right? Like he wrote right, exactly. to me, and, and when exactly. the first the, the developer of this app wrote to me and was like, "Oh, I saw your widget. I'm working on a thing that does this too." And it's like, great, but like eventually you got to discard your thing that you made. Exactly. The, leave exactly. it to the professionals. <laughs> professionals are on it now. <laughs> my pick of the week is a really fun uh, Substack uh, Max Red or Max Read. Dot substack.com read max has put together a literary history of fake texts from apple's marketing materials <laughs> so good highly they, first of all he's hysterical so yeah. he's he's really got some funny commentary on it uh the the he says these eerily cheery aggressively punctuated messages suggest an alternate dimension in which polite good-natured rigorously diverse groups of friends and coworkers use apple products exactly as they are designed to be used <laughs> without complaint or error. But it's not just the most recent. He goes way back in time, starting in 2011. And the screenshots of these, some of them are hysterical. Highly recommend with, it. It's really with fun. With punctuation. With, ex- <laughs> yes, very aggressive <laughs> punctuation. punctuation. Yes. It's amazing. I've yes. never used punctuation. Nobody texts with punctuation. My kids make fun of me for using yeah. punctuation. That's great. Period. Here is a picture. Hey, comma. Here is a I'm picture. home. There's a lot How was the road trip? Send photos, which is a very common uh, <laughs> <laughs> complaint in these. It's really good. So he wrote a great uh, piece because he's he's commenting on this and it's hysterical. You may wonder why this Dimension Apple daughter is sending her mother such a professional and staged looking photograph. <laughs> 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 anyway read max on substack very nicely done max uh yeah. i really like it uh well done it might worth that's worth a subscribe i think yeah and i hope you will subscribe to us because i think we have justified our existence in the universe today uh even though apple doesn't know we know and you know and that's what matters <laughs> <laughs> apple may not think we exist but until, until, of course, we post their ads on there, in which case they try to take us down. Uh, if you want to support what we do, Club Twit is very important to us. More and more so, I want to invite you to join. Uh, we do not do paywalls. Uh, I don't like paywalls, so all our shows will continue to be ad supported and, and, and available to you. We have added some new shows inside the club because uh, we don't have ads for them, and the club pays for them. It seems only fair that the club... Uh, should get them, including Micah Sargent's Hands on Macintosh, Hands on Windows with Paul Therott, Scott Wilkinson's Home Theater Geeks, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz. Uh, all of those are in the club. We have a great Discord, which is a wonderful community, fun to chat in. And all of this, ad-free shows too. I forgot to mention, you get ad-free versions of all the shows, $7 a month. Twit.tv slash club twit. More and more, this is how uh, our future is going to require. This is how we uh, go forward. Right now, 1% of our audience uh, are club members. I'd love to, if we get it to 2 or even 3%, which seems to be reasonable, uh, we wouldn't have to worry about uh, the on ongoing recession in advertising for podcasts. Uh, it's very important. Twit.tv slash club twit. I thank you. Uh, in advance you can watch this show for free uh whenever you want we stream it live during the production at twit.tv slash live somebody said i just can't sit and watch six hours of shows uh you don't have to (laughs) 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 i have to uh but you don't have to so uh, if you want to watch live.twit.tv if you are watching join us in the irc that's free and open to all irc.twit.tv or of course a club twit member you can go into the uh, discourse, Discord. There's a discourse open to all, as I mentioned earlier, as our sponsor discourse, twit.community. We also have our own Mastodon instance like Jason does. Ours is uh, twit.social. He's his zeppelin.flights, but, you know. Uh, for fun. You know, different strokes for different folks. Uh, <laughs> uh, after the fact, on-demand versions of the show are available as I said, ad supported, so they're free at twit.tv slash mbw for MacBreak Weekly. Uh, there's also a dedicated MacBreak Weekly YouTube channel. You can watch things there. Uh, and, and of course, if you subscribe in your favorite podcast catcher, uh, you'll be able to watch whenever you want at your leisure. Um, I thank you all for joining us. I wish you a wonderful week. We will see you again next week. iPhones and Apple Watches in hand. But now I'm sad to say it's my dire duty 
to inform you it's time to get back to work because break time is over. See you next time. Hey, I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine, and each week I join with my co-host to bring you This Week in Space, the latest and greatest news from the final frontier. We talk to NASA chiefs, space scientists, engineers, educators, and artists, and sometimes we just shoot the breeze over what's hot and what's not in space, books, and TV. And we do it all for you, our fellow true believers. So whether you're an armchair adventurer or waiting for your turn to grab a slot in Elon's Mars rocket, join us on This Week in Space and be part of the greatest adventure of all time.